I was in a conversation a little while ago on another interview show and there was a debate between me and this other person about whether money makes you fulfilled or whether you can be fulfilled without money. And my position was that absolutely you can become fulfilled without having money and that money is not the key to fulfillment. This other person's contention was if you don't have money, you can't be happy. And I want you to know that I just don't believe that that's true. I know plenty of people who have money who are not happy and are not fulfilled. Having said that, I've been happy when I was poor and I've been happy rich. Happy rich is far better, I can promise you that. But it is not the gateway to happiness. I'll give you an example. Show me a father or a mother with $100 million in the bank, but no purpose, no calling, no contribution in their life. And they've got a child at home that's, God forbid, dying of leukemia. Do you think that that's a happy and fulfilled person just because they have money? You have another parent and they have no money. They make $60,000, $70,000 a year. But they're a school teacher, let's say, or a nurse, and they're fulfilling their purpose. They're making a difference in the world. They're making a contribution and they have healthy children. Who do you think is more happy and fulfilled? And so clearly, there are elements of our life that are far more important to creating happiness and fulfillment than just money. And so, now having said that, people say all the time, material things won't make you happy. I can't disagree with that more. In fact, we have all the evidence in the world of knowing that. I'm living here ocean right now. Living by this ocean makes me happy, right? Ladies, if you've ever bought an outfit or a pair of shoes or a car or any material thing you've wanted in your life, you're happy when you buy them. Guys, you ever got that suit you want or that shirt or whatever it might be material-wise or that watch you wanted? Of course it made you happy. The question is not whether it makes you happy, the question is whether it fulfills you. So you need to begin to make a distinction in your life between happiness and fulfillment. Happiness is fleeting, it's short term. I'm not happy every day I live here oceanfront. I've had many unhappy days in this magnificent place. Happiness is conditional, happiness is fleeting, it comes and goes, and by the way, you want it to. If you are happy every single second of your life, the bliss of it, wouldn't affect you like it does. We want the ebbs and flows of life. The downs in our life make the highs so much sweeter. I can promise you that you, didn't, you don't want to be happy every single second. What you do want to seek though is fulfillment. Material things, living oceanfront, having jets, having Ferraris or Rolls Royces, they can make you happy short term, but they will not fulfill you. And so what we're gonna talk about today is both getting happiness and fulfillment. Let me be very clear with you. If your desire is to become wealthy, is to become rich, is to have all the material things in life, because it was one of mine, I can tell you, I wanted to live here oceanfront, I wanted to have a lakefront home, I wanted to take care of my parents, I wanted to fly private, then I wanted my own jet. I've had a Rolls Royce and I've had a Toyota, and I can tell you up front, I'd rather drive the Rolls Royce. So that doesn't make you shallow, that means that you have goals and you like the finer things in life. And for many of you listening to this, that's something you're gonna chase. And I want you to have those things. For some of you, those things don't matter to you at all. You just wanna make a difference. You wanna make a contribution. And I can tell you, the material things in your life don't matter and that's perfectly fine. But for those of you that wanna chase the material things, I want you to have them. But by no means am I going to let you think, because I've been there, that somehow that's going to fulfill you. Because guess what? You have to bring you with you everywhere you go the rest of your life. You have to bring you on your jet. You have to bring you to your oceanfront house. And if you don't love you, if you don't like you, if you don't believe in you, if you're not experiencing the right emotions about you, you bring all those emotions with you to these places you go. So I think learning the strategies of being happy and fulfilled prior to having all these material things will serve you because I have so many friends and I know so many people that have accomplished all the material things in their life and those things made them happy short term but they're living an unfulfilled destination here on earth. So let's talk about that for a minute. The caliber of your life is literally linked to the caliber of emotions you experience on a regular basis. So take an inventory of that for a second. Over the last day, week, month and year, what are the majority of the emotions you experience? Are you enjoying the emotions? Do you experience the emotions of joy, fulfillment, peace, contribution, ecstasy, passion, certainty, faith, strength? Or are you experiencing more regularly the emotions of fear, anxiety, depression, stress, pain? Take an inventory of those emotions. And I can promise you, if you have more of passion, more of strength, more of joy, more of contribution, more of peace compared to having anxiety and pain and stress, 
The caliber of your life is higher with the people that have those emotions. And so it's being conscious that our emotions dictate the caliber of our life. It's then being conscious of what emotions are we experiencing most regularly. And then next, what emotions do we want to experience? What are the emotions you wish you were experiencing on a regular basis? And take an inventory of what those are. Make a list of what those emotions are and begin to seek them, begin to pursue them, begin to be intentional about finding them, and you'll begin to see them more and experience them more just by taking control of the intention of having them. That's the first step, is taking an inventory, being aware that my emotions dictate the caliber of my life. The emotions I want are these three, these five, these seven on a regular basis, and be intentional about pursuing them. You know, Emerson has this great quote where he says, we are what we think about all day long. I would amend that to, we are what we experience emotionally all day long. Now, oftentimes what we think about dictate what our emotions are. And so I can tell you that I believe the pathway to fulfillment, not just happiness, because the ultimate destination in life is fulfillment. We're all chasing that. We're all pursuing fulfillment. That's the ultimate emotion is fulfillment, in my opinion. At least the one I want is fulfillment because it embodies all of the powerful emotions. And so how do we become more fulfilled? I can tell you that I believe the pathway to fulfillment is by contributing to other people, being in service to other people. Chasing your passion and your purpose in the service of other people leads to fulfillment. Let me tell you the pathway, I think, to contributing to other people and truly fulfilling your purpose. Because if you can match being happy with all the short-term things you want to achieve in your life, achievement can be a destination, achievement can be a level, achievement can be a promotion, it could be a certain amount of money, it could be an accomplishment, it could be a home, it could be whatever it is. Achievements make us happy. Contribution matched with achievement is fulfillment. And so I want you to take an inventory. The most fulfilled people I know use the gifts they were given in their life towards the service and contributing to other people. I want you to hear me. People say, I just don't know what my passion is. I don't know what my purpose is. Your purpose is often found through identifying what your giftedness is and then how you can use those gifts to serve other people. And so it's hard for most people to give themselves any credit, but let me tell you something. You were born with natural gifts that were given to you that are special to you. You see the gifts of other people. See, certain gifts put you on TV, good looks, Unbelievable athletic ability, right? A great singing voice. These are the gifts that can put you on television. So most of us think those are the most important gifts in life are only the ones we see on television. See, and then we think because we might not possess those specific gifts, we are not gifted. Let me say to you very explicitly, you were born, and I know this, with unique special gifts that are just yours. You were born for a reason. You were born to make a difference. When you were a little boy or a little girl, there was a time in your life where there was somebody who believed in you. They looked at you like you were special. They knew you were unique. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent or a school teacher or a coach or an auntie or an uncle, but they looked at you a certain way and you just knew they knew you were special. They saw what I call the Christ in you. They saw the gifts in you. And maybe as you got a little bit older, you've forgotten what that feels like. But I can tell you, it was the greatest feeling in the world. Isn't it? In fact, if you pictured that person's face right now, that made you feel that way, you'd begin to almost get emotional because they made you see the gift in you. They may not have known what the gift was, but they made you feel special. Your uniqueness, your specialness is these gifts you were given. And by the way, be very aware of what they are. Your gifts could be your nurturing ability, your kindness, your intensity, your passion, your voice, your looks, your art skills, your ability to problem solve, your listening skills, your speaking skills your peace, your faith, your concern, your intensity, your physical strength, right? Your ability to write, your ability to think, your ability to care, your ability to be there for people, your work ethic. There are literally thousands of gifts and I promise you if you begin to ask yourself some deep questions, you begin to understand your desire to help people, your intentions, your sense of humor, your patience level, you have all kinds of gifts that you were given, but there are two or three or four that are yours. And if you'll identify what those two or three or four gifts are, and you begin to use those gifts in the service of other people, you will be ultimately fulfilled. In my case, you know, I, I feel like I, my gift is that I, I was born with the ability to articulate. I was born with the ability to learn. I was born with the ability to just deeply care and believe in people. God was good enough to give me the ability to kind of communicate those words in a way that's easy to understand. And so I've taken some of the gifts, my couple, my two or three, I don't have 50, I'm not better than you, but I've sort of identified some of the gifts I have is I love people, I care about people, 
I'm pretty good at speaking, right? I, I, I want to make a difference. I intend to serve. And so I've taken those skills and I've used them to serve other people in my life and it fulfills me. It's not work to me. It makes me fulfilled. My house may make me happy short term, my jet might, but I can tell you what fulfills me is making a difference in the lives of other people and it's what will fulfill you as well. It's dropping this notion, as I've said in other audios, you are not your possessions. You are not your accomplishments. You are not what other people say you are, good, bad, or indifferent. You are not those things. And you are not what you look like. You are your gifts. You are these two or three or four things. This is the basis of who you are, or these gifts. This is the true you. And when you begin to do this, when you begin to utilize those gifts in service of other people, you become inspirational. Yes, you, you inspire people. See, the root of the word inspire is to be in spirit. When you are in spirit and serving people with the gifts you were given, Mike, who's filming this right now, one of his great gifts is his patience, is his artful eye is his ability to see the right setting like we did today when we're shooting here. It's his concern to make me look good. It's the pride he takes in his work. These are some of his natural gifts and now he's found them and we've partnered together, his gift and my gift and the gift of my team to serve you. This will begin to fulfill you in your life. All of you have those gifts. And so when you begin to identify what they are in the service of other people, you will begin to change your life. That is who you truly are. That is when you begin to experience those emotions that serve you, that begin to transform your life. If you want to be happier and if you want to be more fulfilled, go achieve, go accomplish, go chase those things, but do things every day that feed these emotions that you want, not the ones you don't want. Root out the emotions you don't want. Pursue and chase the ones you do and begin to use those gifts to serve other people and fulfill your purpose in being here in the world. I'm gonna give you 10 things that I want you to be more of. I want you to embody more of in your life. I, I want you to take an inventory of the man or woman. If you could be more of these 10 things, they will deliver to you more of these emotions. Number one, I want you to be unique. I want you to be special. See, I believe the opposite of bravery is to conform. Conformity is the opposite of bravery. You don't need to be like anybody else. Stop trying to be a part of the group. Be unique, be special, be you. Celebrate the uniqueness that is you. Yeah, you may take some criticism. You've probably taken it in the past. Every time you've tried to be yourself, you've taken a little criticism. But I can promise you, one of the gateways to more of these positive emotions is to be unique, be special, be you. Number two, be love. Yes, be love. I know that may sound corny, especially to some of you guys that are listening to this, but just be more loving. I think you'll find the more love you put out into the world, and I don't mean this in some fluffy way, I'm serious, the more you love people, the more you smile, the more you truly love in life, the more you get it back in your life. Number three, be truth. Just honor your truth more often. And even in the difficult times, be honest and truthful with people. Number four, be kind. One of the rarest things in the world today is just a kind person. Just taking the time to be more kind to people. We need more kindness in the world. And the more kind you are to other people, the more those emotions come flooding your way. Number five, be beautiful. And I mean it, be beautiful. Begin to celebrate your beauty. I know for some of us that's difficult because we're aware of all the things about us that aren't beautiful. The more you just be beautiful, I can tell you, the more you begin to accept you the way you are, that you're perfect as you are, it doesn't mean we don't want to look better. It doesn't mean we don't want to improve our condition, be healthier, be stronger, look better. But the bottom line is, if we can't begin to love how we look now, we're not going to love how we look at any point. We're never going to love it. Just be more beautiful now. Number six, be moving. You must always be moving your body. See, the great emotions come from us when we're moving our body. See, emotions are physical as well. They're a physical thing. When, you, you know how you feel when you're working out or you're in that special moment with that special someone and privacy? You're moving your body at that time, aren't you, right? Laughter is a movement, right? See, um, emotions are movements. It's a state of being. The more you're breathing deeper, the more you're moving your body. Moving your body creates positive emotions. Stagnation, laying down, hunched over, all these emotions, sitting at your desk too long every single day, laying in bed, laying on the couch, not moving, driving in the car is when all the negative emotions hit. You'll find that when you're moving, running, moving your body, exercising, just getting in a peak state, being conscious of your posture and your physiology and moving yourself, you'll You'll find it's almost impossible to experience the negative emotions when you're moving and the positive ones come flooding in. Number seven, be growing. 
As we've talked about previously, either growing or dying in your life. A growing person is experiencing the positive emotions of life. A person who's not growing, they start to experience depression and fatigue and fear and anxiety. Be growing all the time. It's a gateway to all the positive emotions in life. Number eight, be silly, be playful. See, you were the happiest probably when you were a little, little child, when you were playful and you didn't care what everybody thought about you. Start to have more childlike enthusiasm in your life. Be silly. Be willing to look bad and look goofy. The happiest people have more childlike emotions, more childlike enthusiasm. We all get older and we get buttoned up and we want to look a certain way and present our certain selves and think there's a, a way we're supposed to act all the time. And we lose the inner child and from there we lose the emotions a child gets to experience. Number nine. Be forgiving. Forgive people. It will set you free and open you up to all the positive emotions in your life. If there are people you need to forgive, do it. It's your lack of forgiveness that's holding you back from getting these positive emotions. It's holding on to this thing you're holding over somebody, even though you think they may deserve it. If you don't forgive them, you've blocked yourself, you've cheated yourself from all the joy, all the peace, all the passion in your life as you're holding on and not forgiving somebody. That lack of forgiveness is giving you the anxiety and the stress and it's blunting your access to the best emotions. Be forgiving. And then number 10, be courageous, be bold. The most courageous people in life experience the greatest emotions. They take risks. They overcome adversity. They put themselves in uncomfortable situations. They show courage. They step in when needed. They're people's heroes in their life. They do things they're afraid of on a very regular basis. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is taking action in the presence of fear. I promise you, the more courageous you are, the more you are opening yourself to the best emotions in life. These 10 things, these 10 steps, these 10 ways of being are gateways to the positive emotions in our life. And when you combine that with identifying your gifts and using them in the service of other people and being conscious of wanting these emotions, your entire life is going to transform. Hey, it's Ed my lad. I just wanted to thank you for being here and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. I told you when we were getting ready to do this, I said, I want to ask you, and this, is, this seems uncorrelated, but it's not. It's totally correlated because it comes from a pain point from you, and it comes from a place of, of a, a sanctuary that can preserve and increase energy, which is personal relationships, and so particularly your marriage to Lisa. So you've been honest on my show before, and by the way, this is completely correlated to everything we said, because you said on the show before in the past, hey, man, first time around probably didn't have that thing wired the right way. Yeah. At some point, I knew I wasn't probably with the right person for me, wonderful person, but not right person for me. I wasn't a world-class husband. Yep. You've, you've, you've said this before. And you are a world-class husband to Lisa. In it's fact, also a true story. It is. When I think of you, and by the way, you're easily one of the most brilliant business minds I've ever met. You are probably the best marketing mind I know. Oh, and you're you. a very diverse man between your understanding of real estate, human dynamics, interpersonal relationships, energy, influence. I mean, all the different business markets that you're in. You're a very unique man. And, I, you know, I hold you in the highest regard. You're one of the few people on the earth that I call for counsel in certain areas. So, obviously. Well, same to you, brother. Same thank you. you. And of all that, I don't admire you uh, anywhere nearly as much for those things as I do for the kind of husband and father that you are. And I think one of the, I think you show me the quality of your relationships. I think Tony was the first to say that. I'll show you the quality of your life. You have such a massive high quality of life. And I believe that's because of your relationship with Lisa and your children. Why is it so good? In other words, what's been the key from you going to be a not very good husband the first time around to like, if I think of the list of the best husbands I know that have the best, real intimate, loving, real, real not perfect. Yep. relationships with people. I don't know that you don't occur first on my list. You know, m maybe there's two or three people that all come up at the same time, but you come up on that list. What's been the key for that and how important is it to your, your outward success in business? Because yeah. there's a correlation from when yeah. you met her to millions and millions more dollars in your bank account too. It is. And, and I have to thank you for saying that. And you're, yeah. you're so kind, Ed. It's why your, your podcast does so great. You truly serve from your heart. Um, and thank you for the kind words. My wife's going to listen to this podcast and smile <laughs> Lisa, from ear to ear. She, true, she loves you, brother. She, she's love she's binging on your podcast right now. <laughs> good, good. Um, 
I'll tell you, first, first thing I'll share, just like a business, is if you have the nerve to recognize that the reason your business might not have worked or your marriage might not have worked or your relationship might not work, if you're if you have the self-awareness and the nerve to look in the mirror and say, it was probably you, mm-hmm. even if it wasn't all you, but if you have the nerve to say that, and I remember going through a divorce and freaking out because, and I won't go deep on this because I think I shared it on a previous one, but I was freaking out for my kids because I was a child of divorce and I didn't want them to feel, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you get it, right? Yep, totally. So I was freaking out about that. And then I remember thinking to myself, I wrote down a list of what was unacceptable in a new relationship. What, what could not be and what could be. And on my, on my could list, Ed, was I need someone that, that loves a crazy entrepreneur that's into health, that's into personal growth, someone who will love my children as if they're their own. Yeah. That's, that's a task for a step person, a step one. parent, right? And I, I wrote down this long list of all the things that were a must and something hit me in that list and I'm like, damn, I have nerve to ask for that, <laughs> right? Right. right? And in a moment, I recognized that for me to attract that, I had to become a better man. Mm. It had nothing to do with finding the perfect woman. I had to be the better man to attract that type of woman. Mm. And I worked on me. I got a love coach. I, I unlocked the, the, you know, holding back the full extent of love and all, all the things we could share. But here's what I would say when it comes to relationships. Um, just this, you know, advice only from a guy that mm. knows he messed up in the past, but I am in the greatest relationship in my life is imagine never keeping the couple of things that came out of what I realized. Imagine never keeping score in a relationship. Mm-hmm. Imagine having the nerve and the confidence to just go, I'm going to be the best version of me and I hope I get it back mm-hmm. and not say, you know, I've been, I've been doing, I watch relationships unravel when someone says, the husband says, I work my tail off. I provide for her. She doesn't have to worry about anything. She doesn't have to pay the bill. She has someone to clean her house. She does all this. And I come home and, and she's, you know, no dinner, keeping mm. score, mm. right? You're keeping score. And wow. when you start keeping wow. score, as wow. soon as you car- start keeping score and it's not even, how do you go to bed that night and be intimate? How do you, ha- how do you have passionate connection if you're keeping score and thinking I'm doing more than her or, or I'm taking care of the house? He has no idea what it's like to, to juggle two kids and take care of all this stuff. And he's out flying around, having fun, do it. You know, he's working, but at least he yeah. gets to be out. I'm stuck in the house. Mm-hmm. Man, there's the intimacy's gone, mm-hmm. right? And then once the intimacy's gone, then people start thinking, man, someone else would love the way I work. Someone else, the way I take care of things, right? So one is not keeping score. Here's the, the toughest one. That's big. Here's the toughest one. Imagine, I know this is going to sound crazy and some of you are going to be like, yeah, whatever, dreamer. Mm-hmm. Imagine feeling love when you give it rather than when you receive it. I fell in love with making my wife feel loved. I love for that woman to look at me and she like there's five people in the room and she looks over and I'm staring at her like she's like I just saw her for the first time and she catches me and I watch her face. We've been together five and a half years. I could stare at my wife when she doesn't realize it. If she catches me, her cheeks will get red like she gets nervous even today and she's like, like, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? And she'll come over. She's like, you, right? Mm. I found, a, I, it took me years. I found a way to feel love when I make her feel loved. So I don't need her to love me back. But, the, but here's the thing, right. Right? right? Because I don't keep score, my wife tries to outdo me. Mm. Because I, give, I feel love when I give her love, she tries to give me more love, right? And I know maybe that takes the right partner. And you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, Dean, you found the right partner. I, I, I would say I have an amazing woman. But I also know that I did all the opposite crap in the, in the previous one. Mm. And, and this is, I'm going to steal this from Tony. One of the best advice I ever heard was, imagine if you treated the end of relationship like the beginning. Would there actually be an end? You remember in the beginning of a relationship, you're like, everything's bliss and you're all in and you're listening eye contact and you wouldn't dare look at your phone at dinner. And now you're three years in and at dinner, she wants to tell you about what happened with the kids today. And you're like, yeah, let me just, what was that? Hold on, babe, let me just look at my phone one second. Mm -hmm. Would you have ever done that in the first week of your relationship or on a first date? Mm -hmm. And that just, that hit me. And people a lot of times will ask me, is like, I don't know where my relationship is. I'm like, what if for the next 90 days you just went all in? And pretended like you guys just met and you were dating again. Mm-hmm. At the end of 90 days, you might have a completely different situation. That's so good. Yeah. That's so good. You're so good. I don't Has know. Has that fed 
your business life having that part of it? Not even a question. Like yeah. the funny part is so many people say to me, what happened to you like four years ago, man? You just got yeah. more dynamic. You're more confident on stage. It was definitely that because the, the last thing I'll say is on this is I had more, I've had more success than I could have ever dreamed possible. Mm -hmm. A good zillion times more than what my dreams were. I have two, I'm now three and a fourth on the oh, way, yeah. but I had two amazing children mm -hmm. that were just humble and sweet and, and kind. And my business is thriving and good friends, but I didn't have love in my life and I didn't have connection mm -hmm. and I wasn't a good husband, mm -hmm. right? Because I wasn't happy. And I probably, when you're incongruent, when not all things in your life are lined up, I never could have understood the power of that while I was in it. I just said, no, I should be happy. No, my relationship isn't great, but we co-parent good and we got great kids and the business is good and we got the great house. I just wasn't in alignment. Ed. I was kind of living a lie. Yeah. And when I finally shed that, and now I get to be the man, like, mm. and I know you know me, but man, imagine the wish that if anybody put a hidden camera on you for a week, mm. And then your wife, your friends, and the world could watch it and go, wow, same guy on camera, same guy yeah. on the podcast, same guy when no one was watching. Yeah. That congruency has taken the, the restrictions off. My business has doubled. My life has doubled. My happiness has doubled. I've attracted dear people in my life like you and other people because I, I think that I, I just get to be me at all times. Beautiful, brother. I also find, and you talk about this in the book, I think successful or happy people have a different relationship with discomfort than unhappy people. Sure. Meaning, I, I kind of enjoy doing uncomfortable things. I have found, after pursuing them over and over again in my life, that I, I'm more familiar with it, I guess, now. And I kind of see it as a space I like to be in. Whereas I think most humans, because we're wired this way, our natural proclivity is to avoid discomfort. And it's another one of the principles yeah. that you have in the book. Yeah, Lance Armstrong told me one time, he was like, I trained because I love riding the bike. He's mm -hmm. like, I raced for money, mm -hmm. right? And so do you love wow. the work or do you love the thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, it, here's the thing, people go, whoa, whoa, whoa. but if you love the thing and you, you can't not do it, you will also most likely be very good at that thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, 100%. You, Tell my you, kids that. If you wrote the book because you loved it and you put everything that you didn't cut any corners, you did your best, you're 100% locked in, chances are more often than not that is going to work. If you're writing the book because you mm. think this is a lucrative niche and you want to cash in at this moment and you think it'll help your career, be a good business card, maybe, but most of the time it won't. So it's really about averages like what's yeah. what added and so like a comedian who loves the the act of stand-up will do so much stand-up that eventually they will become world class and they'll get the specials and all the other things yes. but if you're if you're in it because you think it'll be fun because you think it'll get you girls because you yep. think it'll impress your parents yep. if you think it'll piss your parents off you're going to find that when it gets really hard you don't have what it takes to stay with it yeah staying power is only through the love of the game to some extent in the book, part one's the exterior of the body, part two's the inner domain, temperament. Hey, this guy's stuff is so good, right? Um, the soul is another part of the book. Morning routine may be the single most over-talked about thing in the history of personal development yeah. I mean, in the last 10 years, right? And yet, yet, how many people have good morning routines? Well, that's the deal, and that's why I want to talk yeah. about it with you. I think it became a fad. Yeah. Actually, I think it's talked about way more than implemented. Yes. I really do. Yes. And I actually know some of the dudes who talk about it who even themselves don't implement the morning routine that they yeah, talk yeah. about. So you talk a little bit about attacking the dawn. Yeah. Another thing I've grown to know in my life is the happiest and successful people I know do a lot of stuff earlier in the day than the people that I know that aren't as happy or yes. successful. I want yeah. you to talk about both those things. So to me, well, I, I tell the story of Toni Morrison in the book. She had this yes, great line. She's so like, good. I got to get up and get to work before I hear the word mom. And I think that's actually the same thing that rich, successful, like billionaires get up and work out at the gym at 4 a.m. Yep. because that's their time. Mm -hmm. they, they cannot leave the office at 2 p.m. to go work out. There's mm -hmm. too much happening. The day gets away from you. Like when I hear about people who are like, yeah, you know, and then I write, you know, maybe in the afternoon. No, you got to know when you do it. And that's always got to be when you do it. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to find reasons to not do it. Yes. And, and I think uh, Pete Holmes, another comedian, once told me, he's like, getting up early is like robbing a bank when no one's there. Oh, good. Really you know? Good. And you're like, the morning, there's less interruptions, less people. 
my thing is I don't touch my phone for the first 30 minutes to an hour I'm awake. And I just, that's my time. I, I don't actually write right when I wake up. Mm-hmm. I take my kids for a long walk. We do this a lot. My kids are still young. So mm-hmm. we do a long walk outside in the morning mm-hmm. before I've been sucked into stuff. Mm-hmm. So I carry that. Like I know even if the day gets away from me, I had quality time with my family. I had quality time outside. Mm-hmm. I got active. I thought I was intentional thinking about what I have to do today, what I want to do well. And then when I sit down to write, I got, that's what I'm bringing to it. Not, I check Twitter before my feet even hit the ground out of bed and I'm already pissed off mm. and already distracted. Like that, you're, you're not setting yourself up for success. I love you. The number one non-negotiable part of my routine is not touching my phone the first 30 minutes. It's also the hardest thing to, for me to have developed was that. Yeah. I find it the most valuable thing. I've gone back and forth, cold shower, no cold showers. I've done, you know, I'm going to get up and train really hard in the beginning. I'm going to do my writing early in the morning. I'm going to do my, I've moved those things around. What I've not moved around in a very long time is touching my phone the first 30 minutes. I think it's the, I think because it's so difficult to do, it ought to prove to everybody how valuable it actually is to do it. And I, I have to sleep with it in the other room. So if I get up and go to the bathroom mm-hmm. in the middle of the night, I'm not like, what's happened? Like, yeah. I, you got to create some shelter. So that way, you know, if you're getting a good amount of sleep, that's like, mm-hmm. you know, seven, eight hours of no phone consecutively, mm-hmm. which has already set you up for a good, a good yeah. day where you're not the majority of that time on the phone. Well, I think it tells you who you are. I yeah. think if you're grabbing your phone the first thing you get up, you've decided I, I'm a responder and a reactor in my life. I don't dictate any of the terms. Yes. I'm in no control of anything. And I think if you can at least wait 30 minutes, you've just that is that choice in and of itself gives you a form of control. Even if what's in that phone, by the way, needs response when you get there, you've set a syntax or a context of your life that the whole world is not going to dictate to me what happens in any given day, that I'm in charge of this, at least to some extent. Now, I think if you can get some control over the first 30 minutes of your day, some control over the last 30 minutes, there's a higher probability yeah. you'll have at least the illusion of control yeah. over the middle of your day. What's well, like, do you use the phone or does the phone use you, Yeah. right? And it's like, if you if you can't control when you use it or not, like, you're the tool. Yeah. A friend of mine mm-hmm. telling me his Literally. morning- Literally. Yeah, his, yeah his, <laughs> his morning routine is like, get up of course i check my phone real fast to see if there's any fires i have to put out mm. then i go do this stuff and it's like do you ever not find fires <laughs> what do you right? think's in there of course that's what right. that's what the phone is but that's also what you are looking for yes. and by definition you're going to find, find it. it i want to start the day in control yeah. with a big like the long view mm. i want to to set the pace right mm-hmm. you don't want you don't want the fact that one of your colleagues emailed you at 3 a.m with something that's not really important but they Actually, Michael uh, Bostick and, and, and Lauren told me this. They were like, your inbox is, your, is a to-do list put together by other people. So good. It's That's so good, really right? Good. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, so I'll get to those things when I get to them, not when you get to them. Very good. See, there's so, there's, let me just tell you something. Ryan's work is so loaded that what we'll cover in this hour is going to change your life. But it is honestly maybe 2% of even just this book. Not, I'm not saying that to make Thanks. you feel good. but Because I, I, I have all these circles I made, and I yeah. can already tell I'm not going to get to a lot of them. But So you said, look, I get up, I don't check my phone, I go take this walk with my kids. Now I'm kind of creative. In the book, you say perfectionism is actually a vice. Yeah. Right? That's a strong term to make, yeah. right? And I think the reason most people that struggle struggle is they have a higher threshold of how good yeah. or prepared they think they have to be to take an action in order to not take. In other words, most people I know that are pretty successful or happy have a lower threshold of how good they think they have to be at something before they'll begin it. They'll yes. step into a space and say, I'll figure it out when I get there. And when I get there, I'll figure out the next space. And I'll figure... That doesn't mean they don't practice pre- preparation. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm more, I'm more confident in today's interview because I prepared my ass off for sure. this, right? But I also know something could happen that I'm not prepared for and it doesn't cause me to not pursue this craft. That's totally right. I think the more you've done, the more experience you have, the more confidence you have in yourself. And so you under you can remember how things were when you started, which is not anywhere close to where they were when you finish. There's a Hemingway quote. I have it on a poster on my wall. He says, the first draft of everything is shit. Or anything I forget, but I did. I did a version of it where I marked it up. Like even yeah. that sentence, he didn't. That didn't come out perfectly formed. Right. He shaped that. Right. And so uh, writing as a metaphor, you get comfortable with first drafts. Mm. You go, 
if I don't do it because I want it to be perfect, it will never be good. And then I can't polish it to perfection. Mm. Right. And then perfection itself does not exist. It's a ma- It's the horizon. It's always a little bit further away. Yeah. And so if you get com- like for me, it's like I'm just trying to r- make something that exists, then I can edit it and shape it and change it and improve it. Mm. But if I'm so first off, high on my own supply, so convinced I'm a genius, whatever, I'm I'm never gonna actually do it. Yeah. And then it, it will be perfect in my head, yeah. but it won't ever be shippable. Oh man, that's really true. Speaking of first, I love this. You say uh do hard things first. Yeah. Why? Well writing is the hard thing in, in my mm-hmm. profession. So it's like I don't allow myself to make up a bunch of other stuff that I do first mm. to get then distracted. Like mm. I, I hate, I think breakfast meetings should be illegal, yes, right? Why? Breakfast coffees, yeah. morning staff meeting. Yeah. No, go do the work. Then once we've made some headway, then we have the luxury of going, Hey, what's the next thing we need to be thinking about? Like yes. if you're, again, if you, if you're putting it off, you're going to come up with reasons that you never have to get to it. Brother. I'm a disciplined person. I'd like to think. And here's how right he is. You actually write about someone that I work with in your book. I won't say who it is, but she used to run a country. And, um, and I work out first in the morning. Yeah. It's one of the first things I do. And the reason that it's one of the first things I do is because it's hard for me. Yeah. And after 30 some odd years of being in gyms, it's not my favorite place to go anymore. It just isn't. So I have to do it early in the day. Well, some of my coaching has started to happen overseas, yeah. which means they're up. I have to get up really early to do these coaching calls with some of these people. One of them is a woman in your book. And on the days where I coach her, I don't work out early in the day, right? right? And I have it kind of scheduled like around 11 o'clock. I'm just being real with you. All of a sudden, around 11.30, I'm on Instagram again. 12.15, I'm doing emails. 1 o'clock, you know what? I'll do it at 5 o'clock after dinner. No, this is me, and I've trained for 35 years. There have been several days I just didn't work out those days. And it's pathetic, but it's because you should do hard things first in your day. You've proven it, and I'm I'm evidence of it. With this hard, I got to change. Yeah, I got this other. thing. Then I got to take a shower after. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll just do it. Get it out of the way. Yes. And and that's how I think about like writing is the win every day for me Mm because that's what I do. If if my thing was training people, I would do the training. Whatever the win is, you got to do that. Cross it off. Mm And then if you get to the other stuff, that's extra, Yeah. right? It can't be you do the extra and then maybe you get to the, the main mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. I, I spoke to the Rams a couple of years ago and they said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> like, what is that for you? Mm-hmm. And then is your day built around it? Yes or no? Because yes. if it's not, what does that set? It's very true. It's like I just got a coaching call yesterday with some entrepreneurs. I'm like, are you actually moving the needle with what you're doing? Yeah. And you can look at your life and your day that way. Early in your day, are you moving the needle on your day? Or are you kicking the needle down the road, so to speak, right? And it's just, and also you get momentum. When what's the thing, the, other, the way I think about it too is like, what are the things that only I can do, mm-hmm. right? right? Everything else you yeah. outsource, but it, it's like, uh, it, what is the main driver here for me? It's like, am I writing, coming up with the ideas? The other stuff is important, mm-hmm. but it's downstream from that. Really good point. And you got to know what that is. Like mm-hmm. the most powerful law in economics is the law of comparative advantage, mm-hmm. right? If I pick apples uh, better than you and you pick oranges better than me, we can't both be picking each other's stuff. We got to <laughs> find our lane, stick to it. And then that makes the whole economy grows as a result of that. So good. So good. So good. The, uh, we should have done the three hours that I told you. I want to keep going. I told him we're not going three hours like you did in Rogan, but I kind of want to go three I don't hours. Have anywhere we, to go. we won't go that far. But so the part of the work that affects me the most, and maybe it's the crux of the work, and maybe it's only the crux of the work for me, right? I bet different parts of what you're writing about. But you talk a lot about having the, I'll use my terminology and you can correct me, the discipline to to deny or pass on temptation. Yeah. in life, right? So it's this this idea that there's temptation. Sure. And someone who is, I guess, uh, practicing more stoicism than someone who is not has developed the ability to not give in to those temptations, whatever they might be yeah. in life. The thing I have seen hurt most humans in my life has been their inability to deal with temptation. A, they become successful, and now they get the temptation if they're a guy of women, or yeah. the temptation of, I've saved a bunch of money, the temptation to spend it. Um, drugs. It, drugs, whatever it might be. Also, the temptation to watch Netflix, the yeah. temptation to be gluttonous, the temptation, and it, this is for anybody in life, but there's these temptations that we sort of have this intuitive knowing, yeah. pull us from who we best are, 
that we give into every single day in different ways in most parts of our life. And the most happy and evolved people I know do it less. Yeah. They don't do it never, sure. but they do it less. Yeah, Seneca, he says, show me a man who isn't a slave, right? One mm -hmm. to his mistress, one to power, one to recognition. He says, uh, even the slave master is mm -hmm. a slave to the slaves, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that like, your big, enormous estate, it, it, like, do you own the company or does the company own you, mm. right? And so I think deciding, like we were talking about with the phone, like who's in control, me or it? And the ability to go like, I don't do that. I'm not gonna, I, that's not for me. I don't care if everyone does it. I don't care if you think I'm weird for doing it. Mm. Um, it doesn't work for me. It's not part of my life. And the ability to have those lines. Like yeah. I always respect people when like, we make fun of people who have like weird dietary things. And yeah. I was like, no, they decided they don't eat this. And that's a rule they follow. I respect so that I when I see it, right? And, and what I tend to find is that that's a transferable skill. Right. So the ability to say, like, I don't do X also allows you to say, I don't do Y. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes cultivating that is really important. The ability to say, like, there's a famous story about Richard Feynman uh, that I tell in the book that is the physicist. He, he's, he's sort of walking to work one day and he just feels this pull, like in the middle of a morning to go have a drink. And he's not an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. and he has no moral argument against drinking, but he doesn't like that feeling, mm -hmm. that feeling of like, go do this. Because that wasn't him. That was some part in him. And that he never drinks a day uh, again in his life. And I, I think you want to cultivate that. Like, what are the things that you're sort of compulsively doing? The things that just sort of you're powerless to do once the idea comes in your head? That's what you want to develop the muscle, the ability to be like, nah, not anymore. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That's really good. So the thing that pops in your mind that's that compulsive temptation is probably the thing. That's the signal. Yes. Okay, right. And then good. developing the ability to be like, I can stop doing con compulsive things is really important, right? That's, a, that's strength, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of strong people can lift heavy things, but then they are powerless. That's what Seneca's saying. They're powerless over this thing. Think about some of their super wor powerful world leader, but they're obsessed with checking their you know their mentions or something yes. right or they're they're obsessed with uh dominating people where they can't stop this impulse and then that ultimately or inevitably tends to lead to their destruction Demise. in some way so is it a little bit about and i don't know that it is so i want to really ask you is it a little bit about chipping away at one's excessive i think so yeah. yeah not getting perfect but chipping away it's not just doing the right things but chipping away at the things that make us less than we're capable of being i think that's right i mean temperance the word yeah. is about what's the right amount so mm -hmm. so some things the right amount is zero right right but a lot of things it's it's a it's a appropriate healthy amount and beyond that point it starts to get a pro like mm -hmm. again like it, it's almost easier to be like i don't drink than to be like this is when i stop drinking yeah. Right. Like I've had enough. Mm. And this is also true for success. Like think about how many boxers can't leave when it's enough. You're right. Right. And then yep. th they go too far and that's yep. that's their downfall. And so, again, cultivating the ability to be like, I decide when this stops. You're right. And when you're listening to this, you might go, oh, well, mine's not drinking or drugs or porn or sex or spending money. Is it worry? Is it worry? Is it anxiety? Is it fear? Is it anger? Control. Control. Good one. Control. Well, you just hit one of mine. Yeah, like the, the micromanaging thing. Yeah, like yeah. you're like, why don't people like working for me? <laughs> right, it's like, right. You're, you, you, you're not fun to work for. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about, I think overall, it's the knowledge of getting quiet and more self-aware and understanding oneself. Is that the basis of the work, would you say, to some extent? And I think that's what Marcus is doing in meditations. He's talking to himself mm -hmm. and working it out on the page. Like mm. your thoughts can deceive you, but when you put them down and you you have to have that discussion, you go, oh yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, putting you make, yourself up for review, the Stoics. Putting say. yourself up for review. It's a difficult thing to do. Well, it's you uncomfortable. Know, yeah, it's uncomfortable, and I I'm doing it lately. It's interesting for my audience to be in real time. You know, I think they're surprised often because, you know, look, the other part of me is like, okay, here's how you do all these things. But I'm also a work in progress. In other words, even for the audience or even my friend, I don't want to be the same guy next year I am this year. Then I have not that same. I want to, my values diminish to the world if I'm the same person. I ought to have new distinctions and new wisdom and new breakthrough. And so should you sure. that are listening to this. Okay. Beware this madness. What is that? That's the part, that's part of the book. I'm like, I, what is that? I'm talking about. 
when you lose we're talking we're talking about losing control when you yep. lose control over your emotions that sort of temporary burst of, madness of insanity mm. anger frustration mm. resentment fear lust right mm. when, when when you're losing control of yourself you're defenseless in the face of that thing i tell the story of sam cassell the basketball player mm. he he hits this great shot as he's running back to celebrate. He can't stop himself from taunting uh, the opponents. And he, he does this. They call it the big balls dance. He, he acts yeah. like he's cradling yeah. his huge balls. <laughs> but he, he fractures his hip in doing this, right? <laughs> it is out basically the rest of the series. They, 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 don't, they don't go all the way to uh, – they don't win the, the finals. The, the idea of like any time you're doing – it's not that the Stoics were against emotion. I think they were out, they were against doing things when consumed by emotion, mm. right? Or, or letting emotions overwhelm you, right? So it's like you get some, you know, rude email. It's not to say you should let someone talk to you that way. It's mm. not to say you shouldn't respond. But like responding with anger yep. is not going to improve things. So the ability to be like, I'm going to step back. I'm going to do this calmly. Almost everything is done better calmly. A hundred percent. By the way, I call it equanimity in my book, calmness under duress, right? Staying in that moment and staying in that. Silence is strength is something you say. I really want to spend a little bit of time on this. I think that silence is, it's free. Yeah. And it's yet almost never taken advantage of by our culture anymore. And even for me, I just interviewed uh, Colin O'Brady. Yeah. It's got a new book called The 12 Hour Walk. And the concept of it is at least put your phone down for 12 hours and take a walk and take yeah. your life. I think more and more with all the noise in our lives in this day and age, people are becoming less and less familiar with silence. They want a lot of people have to have someone else around them or sure. their phone on or the TV on or the radio on or something. And silence is this free space that is so beautiful and liberating that now as humans, we don't even take advantage of anymore. I was a director of marketing at American Apparel for a long time, and, and I, I sort of watched the company go and all the way down. Yeah. And I, the CEO would call me sometimes, uh, like two or three in the morning. I would be asleep. He'd wake me up. And he would just talk to me until he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And at first, well, I was very young, and I thought, you know, am I this important? What is, it? You know, what is this? Is it that he really cares about? And then I realized this man can't be alone yeah. in those two minutes that he's falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And what epiphanies, what changes, what reflections, mm. what awareness might have come if you could have that space. Like it's, it's possible now to fill every second with noise. That's yeah. what your phone is. Yeah. And you have to cultivate that silence because it's in the reflection that you have ideas, you have breakthroughs. I was, I was at a pool one time just getting in to go swimming and someone recognized me and said, oh, I loved your books. And I said, I wrote those books in this pool. Like I swim in this pool because I can't hear anything. I just the you know my ears are underwater. It's like essential. Like I'm alone with my thoughts, and the ideas come to me then. And you have to cultivate that silence. It's you're right. It's free, but it's also like the most valuable thing in the world. It is. That's why so many people tell me my favorite moment of the day is when I'm in bed and I hit the bed, and I'm like, well, if that's your favorite moment of the day, it's telling you that you're yearning for a little silence, a yeah. little quiet. I find myself even like when I travel. When I shut the hotel room door and I'm in there alone, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is so good. Dudes who have kids, they, they got noisy lives. They spend an inordinate amount of time uh, in the bathroom doing what they need to do in there. And they just sit in this little room, sure. do it because it's just a quiet time. That ought to tell us all we have this yearning for silence in our lives that the noise is not allowing us to appreciate how much we need or we want it in our lives. Yeah, look, that's why I like getting up early in the morning. It's quieter then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Get up before the emails have really started, and mm -hmm. then you don't have to have as much strength or willpower to ignore them. What's a practice? Like, what's your life look like? Now, look at the, all these philosophies. By the way, to me, it's just like really great stuff. It's stoicism, but it's just really great stuff about how to yeah. live a little better life. But what's like a practice that you do daily? Is it is it your meditation time that allows you to sort of participate more in this quality of work or what is it that you do my, my uh big morning practice my meditation practice is journaling sitting down and writing things down creating some space between me and the thoughts hmm. and and like we said putting my putting yourself up for review hmm. um i i want to i want to i don't want to wake up 20 years from now and go like man how did i get here i want to be doing that reflection on a 
regular daily basis and catch the things before. Like one of the things I'll notice in my journal is like if I'm saying the same thing over and over again, Mm. well, I need to make some changes, right? If I'm like so tired today, so tired. If I'm writing that three days in a row, like something's wrong with the decisions I'm making in my life. Really good. And I can make those I, I, let's make those changes now before I end up somewhere unrecognizable. I think most people, bro, I love your work. Like, I really do. It's for me. Yeah. It's for me. Um, I know I've said that three times, but I just want to I'll express to you my gratitude for it. The um, of a really good friend of mine who's made lots and lots of money. And uh, he's actually helped a lot of people, too. He yeah. contributes. He gives a lot of money away. He spends a lot of time. And he's unhappy. And by the way, on the surface, you'd go, wow, married to the same person, makes lots of money, gives lots of money away. This guy's living the yeah. life, kind. He doesn't give in to a lot of temptation, frankly. He's a good dude. And he's unhappy. And he said, I just can't figure out why I'm unhappy. And I said, I think I know. And I said, by and large, brother, you've lived a completely unexamined life. In other words, there's never been time for self-examination. And so many of us even listening to this, this might be a breakthrough moment for so many of you. You may be doing good things. You may be growing. You may have all these things. But you're supposed to be examining your life to some extent. I love what you're saying. Put yourself up for review. I use the terminology of an unexamined life. Yeah. And, you know, we should check in with ourselves regularly because we may be so far down a path and winning down a path that is no longer the path that we want to be on or need to be on, but we haven't even examined it for years and years and years, if ever. So that's sort of what you mean to the extent of putting yourself up for review is self-examination, right? Yeah, if you don't know who you are, what you want, what kind of life you want, you just end up defaulting to what everyone else is doing. Or what you used to want. What you've always done. Yeah. Right? And and so it takes, it takes an active practice of yes. questioning, and reviewing and talking, not just with yourself, but also with other people. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have a therapist, a spouse. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you want to be doing this now when you can steer the boat, yeah. not when you've ended up somewhere and you're stuck. Yeah. Right. It, it, if you've been doing the same thing unquestioned for 20 years, yeah. changing course is now going to be really expensive, really difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you've been making these micro adjustments as you go, you know, th- those things cumulatively shape the direction or the trajectory you're going. And if you don't do that, you just end up living a pattern. Yeah. It's just a pattern. It's a pattern of thoughts, a pattern of emotions, a pattern of behaviors, a t- pattern of people. And it just becomes, and, and if we're not careful in our lives, I write about this in my work, our minds move towards what it's most familiar with. Yeah. So if you don't ever have unfamiliar thoughts, unfamiliar examinations, this journaling or this thinking, you just have a life that's a pattern. It's like, what's your North Star, right? Like, what is the thing, not just your main thing, but like, what's the value, the the purpose? Like, what is the main thing you're trying to do that that matters, right? Mm. And then how are you tacking or tracking against that, right? Mm. Is this promotion you were just offered or this attractive stranger that sent you a drink in a bar? Mm. How does that get you closer or further away from that thing? Yes. I, I um Yes. I, I sometimes when I look at like major decisions in my life, like, hey, do you want to move here and do this? Like, hey, do you want to take on this project? I go, when I look back and ask myself why I got divorced, mm-hmm. is this that reason, <laughs> right? Great. But my North Star is I want to be a good spouse and uh, father. Those, yeah. That's really important. My work is also very important to me. And these things are in a, a tension or a balance with each other. But I don't, I don't want the fact that a cool opportunity is there over and over and over, you just default to saying yes to that. Yep. You're you're simultaneously saying no, no, no to these other people and these other things, and then you you you're telling yourself you're doing it for them, but you're not. You're just doing it because it's easier to say yes than it is to say no. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Very good. So, yeah, I relate to that. You end up just sort of chasing the next shiny thing, and and not having an examination of what this means to the other things that matter to you because you don't have a true North Star. I have a true North Star in my life, but one of the things you say in the book about this other people thing is, listen to this, guys, tolerant with others, strict with yourself. That's, you, if you can get to that nuance, you're one heck of an evolved human being. That's the highest level, right? right. Uh, it's easy to just, 
everyone should follow my rules, right? right? right. Uh, but it's called self-discipline for a reason, right? <laughs> you only control this, like, you only control the standards you set for yourself, and nothing will make you more unhappy than making up rules and then being upset that people who've never even heard these rules are not following them, right? <laughs> they didn't sign up for this, so right? Uh, you you got to be comfortable <laughs> being like, these. Are, this is important to me because it's important to me. Mm. And if you want to live your life your own way, I got to be okay with that. Mm. Uh, Cato, uh, Cato the Younger, he's this famous stoic. He's the strictest guy on of himself. He's fearless. He's he, un, incorruptible, you know. Uh, even though he's rich, he, he dresses in plain clothes, all this stuff. But his brother was the opposite. Mm. And he loved his brother. It's like Bruce mm. Springsteen says, sometimes it's your brother, you got to look the other way. Yeah. You know, like you got to go, you're you, you're living your life. If it works for you, it works for you. I can tell you why I don't think it's working for you mm -hmm. if you want my advice. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to criticize you, resent you. And most of all, I'm not going to try to punish you yeah. for doing your things your way. These are all principles just like when you hear them, you're like, yep, I'd live a better life if I did that. Yep, that would be better for me. Yep, that would be better for me. And it's a matter of, I think reading for me, and if you don't read, you listen to audiobooks or whatever, is a form of self-examination. When I'm reading, I might read, I'm think, I'm listening to what's being written, but I'm really reflecting on me as I'm reading the words. I think that's the sure. most powerful way to read. On the soul part of the book, we can't cover it all because when we get the book, by the way, again, we've covered like 2.3% now, but you say the power of giving power away, I, I, it probably you've hit on the area that would be most difficult for me in terms of my evolution would be the power of giving power away. What does that mean and what's like an application of it? George Washington's greatest moment is when he resigns his commission in the Continental Army and says... I don't want to be king. They said he, he could he could have become king of America, and uh, the king of England. When he hears this, he says, "He says, what's what's Mister Washington going to do after he defeats the greatest empire in the world?" And uh, his painter says, I, "I believe he's going to return to his farm." And he says, "If he does that, he is the greatest man in the world." Mm -hmm. To know when to step down, to know when to share, to know when someone is better than you at something. Mm -hmm. This is extremely hard and requires so much self-discipline. Mm -hmm. as, as majestic as that is for, for Washington, when he repeats it again when he voluntarily leaves after two terms. But Marx really has chosen to be emperor. His father is an emperor. He's chosen. But there's this pesky thing that he has a, a stepbrother, yes. right? And what does he do? I, I mean, historically, Machiavelli would be like, you got to get rid of this you guy. you got to kill him. And the first thing Marcus does with absolute power is he anoints his brother co-emperor and his brother also opposite of him in so many ways but he writes in meditations he says what i loved about his brother was how his character challenged me to improve my own so he didn't try to make his brother a replica of himself a mirror of himself he used his brother where his brother could help him and where his brother had skills and he didn't and he was willing to share and let him be him and 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 marcus be marcus and he he wasn't so insecure that he needed everything for himself. And I yeah. think so often we see great athletes, great entrepreneurs, great leaders, great politicians not know when their moment is over. Mm -hmm. And when it's not to say they can't continue to contribute, mm -hmm. but they're no longer the the top spot. Yeah. And if you can't if you're so egotistical, you can't plan for a legacy. You're going to end up creating a legacy. It just won't be a positive one. Yeah, and by the way, that that you're so right. It affects us in every day when we run in our businesses too, thinking that we're the best at everything in our company. Where yeah. if we would give some of the control away to someone who's actually better at these things and have the discernment to give some of that power away and let them go, your company would grow, your life would grow. Maybe even in your family. Maybe your wife is just way better at some of these things than you, and you just ought to let her have them. Or reverse, your husband is. And I think oftentimes in life that that notion of giving the power, it's not easy for me. I'm a control person, and it's something that that's part of my my evolution as a man yeah. has to be connected to that. And once you give them the power, letting them do it their way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, you're in charge of this. Here's how I would do it, but I just want you to do it. However it works, that's on you. Again, this is tolerant with, with others, strict with yourself. Like, I'm going to allow you to be you. I don't want, I'm not so rigid or insecure that I think everyone needs to be exactly like me. The way I do it works for me. Yeah. We all have different processes, different backgrounds, different 
needs, skills, strengths, and, and we got to respect that. You use the word uh, insecure, but I can tell you, and it's correlated for me. I know when I'm afraid to give away control and power. Uh, it's when I'm afraid. Yeah. Which is pretty close to insecure. Yeah. It's when I'm afraid. Like, I'm afraid if I let you do this, my son's going to go. If you handle the discipline, my wife, my son's going to turn out to be like my dad and be a drug addict. Or if I let you run this part of my company, I'm going to go broke. I mean, these are ridiculous correlations we make. But you have to ask yourself when you're not giving control away in your life to people around you, is that from coming from a place of fear? or insecurity, because yeah. I think most of the time that's what you're operating out of when you're trying to hold on to control all the time. I think that's totally right. Speaking about that, we don't have too much more time, and all I'm right. frustrated as heck about it, but I want to go to the book a little bit more. By the way, everybody should get the book. Like, Listen, when you read the book, a couple things is you're going to manage your own life better, lead your own life better. Then there'll also be this part of you that you go, man, if you live in a particular country, I live in the U.S., man, I wish our leaders had more of these characteristics. Man, I wish they had that one thing. You can even think of somebody, you think if they just had that one difference, how much greater they would have been. Their demise was that thing. You'll, you'll see these little pieces in the book. And that could be your demise also when you're reading the book. Ironically, you talk about Queen Elizabeth in the book. Yeah. I, I was just fascinated by the. Uh, she, uh, I've never spent any time thinking about this woman yeah. until obviously lately, right? Yeah. I've never spent any time thinking about her. And I was sort of fascinated when, when passing, I'm like, people really made a big deal about this. I just, maybe I was naive, but you really write about her in the book. What is it that you loved about her so much or admired in her or characteristics you saw in her? I mean, first off, just to think she has the same job for 70 years yeah. <laughs> and she shows up every day. There is no on or off the clock. She is the yeah. queen. And unlike, say, Marcus or a president who has a lot of power, mm-hmm. she has absolutely no power. Mm-hmm. Her job is her poise and her dignity, what she represents. And she has the same job for 70 years. She never gives an on-the-record interview to a reporter. Think about everything she's seen, everything she knows. Think about how wrong the press has been about her. Think about all the things she wants to say and talk about silence. She says nothing because her job is to be impartial. And everything is being done in her name, literally, but she cannot say anything but she she manages to she every, every week she meets with the prime minister i think she's on she was on her like 14th prime minister so she she is i mean she's personally trained by winston churchill she knows so much she is the most qualified mm. and she can't be like that's a bad idea don't do that mm. but she can well what about this have you thought about this mm. i once heard this mm. right so she has to develop how to be uh, assertive without being aggressive she has to keep uh she has to be above the fray she can't be distracted by the noise and then also i think what's particularly impressive about her the the monarchy 70 years ago totally different than it is today and yet exactly the same Mm -hmm. right and so that's what tradition is people think tradition is like keeping everything exactly the same Mm -hmm. no it's finding the north star the the real things and then everything else is negotiable Mm -hmm. and they have this favorite they have this famous motto inside the royal household which is if things are going to stay the same things are going to have to change and so she's malleable and adjustable okay. about the things that don't matter. Yep. And then very firm and rigid about the things that do matter. Very good. And that's if you want to last, if you want to endure, you look at someone who's been in the music business or someone who's been in professional sports or someone who's been business after business. Everything's changed. And yet the core things, Jeff Bezos says, you focus on the things that don't change. Mm-hmm. You got to know what those are, lock into them. Everything else, you're what's new, what's best. You're, that that tension mm. to me requires so much self discipline. Mm. Then you want to talk about physical discipline. I mean, just imagine, like, sh- she's millions of miles, yeah. shaking millions of hands. Mm. She in seventy years fell asleep in public one time, really? and she was like eighty five, and it was a lecture about magnets. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that right? Like, just right. the sheer toughness yeah. of this little old lady. Yeah, it puts all of us to shame. Yeah. I love that you honor. I also love your fascination with history. It's becoming a lost art form. And the more I, even reading your book, I'm a history buff too, but even reading your book, there's things I learned in the book and I'm like, yeah, that applies now. And I want to finish on it because I'm a baseball fan. So I opened up with this, but I want to finish with it. So Babe Ruth is probably the most well-known baseball player of all time. Maybe the most well-known athlete of all time. Certainly pretty darn close. And you kind of in the book do this comparison between Babe Ruth's gluttonous big ass and Lou Gehrig. And for everybody listening to this, this may sound obvious, but Lou Gehrig eventually passed from Lou Gehrig's disease, or yep. ALS, right? So, But Lou Gehrig is known as the Iron Horse, and that's sort of what I knew about him, is he just played in all these consecutive games. 2,100 uh, consecutive games. It's insane. Yeah. 
I don't think I knew what a great player he was. And I want you to talk about it. I'm going to give one thing away because it just blew my mind. This dude's done. Correct me if I'm wrong. They, like, x-ray his hands or look at former x-rays. This dude had, like, 17 fractures in his hands. He broke every one of his fingers and never missed a game. That's insane. It, the, t- the sheer toughness that that requires, just like someone like Queen Elizabeth, to show up every day, not have an excuse, or yeah. even when you have an excuse, is immense. I mean, he gets hit in the head in one game before the era of helmets, goes to the hospital, gets an x-ray. You know, he's knocked unconscious. They go, oh, he's going to miss months. Even the, the, the pitcher that hit him goes, ah, oh, the streak's over. Mm. Next game, it's right in there. Mm. And, and he was like, look, I could have taken a day off. It was that if I took that day off, that pitch would change how I play. Because now I'd be, yeah. I, you know what I mean? He yeah. hits three triples that next game because he knows he has to get back in there. He can't let the excuse win. Oh, my gosh, bro. Like, and it's his relationship with discomfort and pain that made him different. Also, his he sort of embodies this, right? Yeah. His 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 unwillingness to give in to temptation, which which Ruth is doing all the time, drinking he, and eating. He walks into the Yankees dugout and it's, they put these fancy cushions on it. He rips them out. He's like, cushions the enemy, right? He wants it. He wants to be tough. And and look, Babe Ruth, amazing. But sure. when you read about how Babe Ruth treated his body, yeah. You can't and his money. You can't think what could a more disciplined Babe Ruth have done. So you know, I, I talk about this. I wrote this book, Ego is the Enemy. It's the same with ego. Same with this this stuff. It's not that people who aren't disciplined are never successful. It's mm-hmm. not that people with big egos are never successful. Of course they are. Mm-hmm. Often because they're extremely talented. Often because they're lucky. Often because it's not like a death sentence, mm-hmm. but it is a, a ceiling on your potential. Yes. And you know. Babe Ruth's career is cut short because he doesn't take care of himself. Mm -hmm. Lou Gehrig's career is cut short because of a tragedy. You know, but which one did more in that time that they had, right? And and unarguably, it's it's actually Gehrig. Yes, Babe Ruth. I didn't know this. You you taught me it. Babe Ruth calls the shot, hits a home run. Turns out Lou Gehrig hit one that night too, right? Yeah, Yeah, he's he's the workhorse of an athlete. Yeah, which ultimately I think over the long term does more than the sort of you know. You guys, his work is so damn good. And I hope today was this unbelievable ride for you about your own life and different breakthroughs for you. One of yeah. the things that's a principle in the book, and by the way, to me anyway, yeah. you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's a collection of essays, guys, where you're going to laugh, but it makes most of them are like profound life points. Mm. And a few of them are just like points, uh-huh. right? But it's kind of like cynicism versus hope almost to me. Yeah. It's like an overriding thing. Like, hey, yeah. no one's. Pollyanna saying everything's great in your life or in the world. Yeah. But you got two ways you can choose to live your life, right? Like one's with some hope and some, you know, belief that something can be better in your life or the world or you can be better. And the other one is that you can't. No. Yeah. I don't, I definitely, I definitely choose hope. I mean, it really, it's easy to be cynical and kind of quit, but I don't like to quit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? And I also don't like my days to be ruined. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would rather, I'd like it to be. A fun time. Well, you're laughing, and that's one of the points also from the book for me. I always am, especially when you got to the politic thing, set that aside for a second. It's like everyone should ask themselves, it's like, how much laughing are you doing? Yeah. You know, and I I even had to look at this for me about, I don't know, a couple years ago, we went to a friend's house. Uh They were belly laughing, the family. Uh And I could tell this is happens a lot here yeah <laughs> right. and i actually evaluate it because there's uh-huh. love in my home and growth and you know mm-hmm. all that but i was like do we laugh enough yeah you know and then i kind of like what you do is so theoretically important you gotta ask yourself if you're listening like, how much laughing are you doing <laughs> are you taking all this shit way too seriously yeah. excuse my language but like everything yeah. just a bit too seriously like yeah. if you really are renting your time here right right and it really is about making the world better. You yeah. really are blessed to get a chance to be here during this time. Yeah. Maybe dial the seriousness down a notch, right? Uh, yeah, unless it's your work. <laughs> there are very serious people working on very serious problems. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I don't need those guys laughing all the time. I, I don't need my neuro <laughs> laughing <laughs> yeah. as we go into right. surgery. I don't right. need the right, right. exactly. <laughs> those people, right. uh, people trying to figure out healthcare, whatever mm. they're trying to do, mm. guys working on on physics. Yeah, all right. More power to you. I don't need to see you <laughs> at Applebee's doing shots <laughs> at, at 4:30 right. cuz you left the office early. Right. The rest of us 
you know, this is a short time that you're here, especially as an adult with some money in your pocket. Mm. It's a short ride. Like, yeah. it's really not. I, I, one of my big philosophies in life is don't do the math. Don't add up mm. how much time we have. Just enjoy the hell out of it because mm. I don't like <laughs> I don't like the daunting limitation of time. Mm. Uh, but to go against my philosophy of don't do the math, you know, once you get out of school and then find your way after another 10 years, and then you kind of lock it in and you start rolling. Mm. So maybe you're like 30 and then 30, 40s, 50s, 60s. Now your knees are shot, yep. your eyes are going, and it's the same thing. It, so you're dealing with a couple decades there, three decades in the middle. That are really that good. Yeah. Now, do you want to spend that time right. not having as much fun as you possibly can? It's so true. You know what I mean? Get a pontoon boat. Get some bowling shoes. <laughs> get, get, <laughs> right. Make jokes with your kids when 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 my kids come in when there's a fight in the house about what about what? Right. Someone left their shoes. Right. On the steps. Mm. Who cares? It's okay. It's, <laughs> it's okay. It's going to be all right. I know yep. it's aggravating. Yep. I know she doesn't listen. It'll be okay. Yeah. And really, just like, I, I want to have as much fun as possible. Part of that does come with age, though, don't you think? Like, part of that perspective. That's why yeah. it's cool to listen to podcasts of two middle-aged guys talking if you're not so middle-aged, because you can learn from our mistakes. Yeah. yeah. I, took, I, took, I took too many things too seriously. I took offense too much in my life, mm. and I was... Too much in my life, I'd like, you know, I, you're at an airport and some dude cut you off to get his bag in front of you or uh -huh. whatever. I'm like, man, like, why did I let that <laughs> upset me? Like, yeah. I took joy out of my, I woke up today, because I listened to uh -huh. your podcast yesterday, I swear to you, I woke up today and I went, this is today, and I do this for a living. I'm yeah. like, how do I want to feel today? I literally did this this morning. Uh -huh. I'm, I, my family was gone, so I woke up alone this morning. Yeah. It's like, how do I actually want to feel today? I yeah. can start today. And just start throwing my worries at myself, what I got to get done, the mm -hmm. stuff I do and don't want to do. Yeah. Or, like, could I actually, like, choose today? I'm going to think, I just, I think, I like, this sounds really weird to come from me, from my eyes. I was like, I'm actually <laughs> going to be happy today. I actually intentionally got up. <laughs> yeah. And I was kind of happy. And guess what happens? I go into my little home gym. My dog crapped all over the floor uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and normally I'm like, damn. Today I was like, this is freaking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, right. I finally decide. I literally got the sleep walking out of my yeah. eyes, and bam, there's crap all over my gym. Peed everywhere. I got to take 40 minutes and clean this up. Oh and my I God. still, though, you know what I mean? Like, I know. The there's nothing better than that perspective of, of chuckling at yourself. Yeah. Like, I, I find myself doing it when I get up in the middle of the night and have to pee yeah. and go walking. And I'm walking like Sanford and Son. Yeah. My ankles are yeah. uh, they're sore, and yeah. I'm banging into walls. Yeah. And just the little quiet, like... <laughs> Here we yeah. go again. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, this right. is how I walk now. Uh, is just so funny. But I didn't. I cultivated that early. Mm -hmm. I I wasn't. It's kind of a mixed bag. But I remember in high school being like, I have the option. You to, did. How am I going to go into today? Hmm. Like that that thing hmm. of like, and I'm I'm clapping my hands because I literally would kind of do that. Hmm. I'd wake up and be like, Ugh. Hmm. and I was like. All right, let's go. What do we got to do? Like, let's go. let's yeah, let's let's go. Hmm. And when you get older, and I started like my career, and even now, you have to fight it. You got to fight gravity. It's like that that worry or just the drudgery or yes. you wake up and you're like, oh, it's not good. You got to fight it all the time. Yep. But I kind of cultivated it early because I was looking at life through funny. Yeah. I was like, I'm not taking any of this. I, I lost some people really early. So I was like, oh, this is hmm. n not to be taken that seriously. Like, yep. this is really precious time, so let's kind of enjoy I it. I think it's a huge thing, Tom. I actually think it's a huge yeah. thing. It's, it's interesting that of all the people I've had on the show, that it's someone in your profession who points this out, and it affected me. Uh -huh. But, like, really, man, like, I think that's important. Like, this, I take me and stuff too seriously too often there are things i do that really matter yeah but a lot of it doesn't yeah and a lot of things don't and the other thing i've i've done a pretty good job in my life of not complaining probably one of the funniest parts of the book for me uh -huh. was your <laughs> i want you to tell them this story was two of two parts one when you cannonballed into the pool and <sighs> and you remember that Were yeah you, yeah and the other one is when you got you were one of like a billion grandkids. Right. Just tell them that, where you got a card from your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just the point of the chapter is like, stop complaining. Yeah, it's quit your complaining. I yeah. think is the name of the essay. This is awesome. And no. it, I was taught by my 
grandmothers really who were just these like inspirational they were like the the positive thinkers before it was <laughs> in vogue mm. uh and my one and my they the one lesson was don't quit your complaining like don't complain we're all a mess like mm. Nobody wants to, we've all got worries. I want to shift and go forward because I think there's a massive lesson here with you, which is that once you got through, well, you're never totally through it. John still suffers from the, who gets some sores and different things right now in his life. Am I right about that? You still, there's still, you still reminded all the time mm -hmm. of the difference with you compared to what it may or may not have been true. Yeah. It is true. And, and ironically, and it's through the actions of one of my sisters that we probably won't speak about today, but I, my face is not burned. Mm -hmm. So when you look at me at glance across a coffee bar, you see a very ordinary looking guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but right below that face starts the neck and from the neck to my toes, it's third degree burns. Mm -hmm. So um, although I look at first glance, well, you know, dark hair, dude, you know, normal looking fella. Yeah. Right below that though, it, 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 it uh, falls apart. So I've burns and scars and sores, like you mentioned from my neck to my toes, it's a constant daily reminder of what I've been through. What about though, this is what I want to ask you. This is where I think people, this is a massive, oh my gosh moment for my audience. And it was for me, you sort of hid the story most of your life. In other words, which is ironic because we're talking about it now, but you spent most of your life trying to say, no, 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 I'm normal. I'm normal. I'm normal. I'm normal. And I think you have somehow discovered in the process that the real beauty in life is being vulnerable, authentic enough, courageous enough to reveal the scars in our life, metaphorically and literally. So we all have scars. Like I have found when I've been willing to finally talk about my childhood with my dad, that the impact I've made is much greater. Yeah. I think most people think, oh, my divorce disqualifies me from being successful or happy, or this, my sin has, or, you know, my financial failures, or some part of me that's inadequate, my scars, my weaknesses disqualify me. And you spend a pretty decent part of your life sort of trying to hide your right. scars. So talk, speak to that for everybody, because I think everyone needs, to, this is maybe one of the great life lessons you'll ever hear everybody. And it may be maybe going into 2023, which is coming soon for those of you listening at this time, maybe it'll be a different year for you after you hear John speak to this. So go ahead, John. Well, it's a lot of pressure on me. So uh, hopefully we'll live <laughs> into it together, Ed. Let's change years, man, for individuals. Yeah. And the cool thing is our conversation reminds them that they can do this in their lives. So like, mm -hmm. it, it's not my job, but it is our job collectively to do this work. And it is yeah. possible. You when you eat your own talk, potatoes. Yeah, that's right, brother. Yeah. When, when um, you're burned as badly as I was, the dream in life is not ultimately to end up on your show, Ed, or to right. become a speaker myself. Right. My dream was to be ordinary. Like all I wanted out of life was to disappear. Hmm. And I did that for a long time, for 20 years. Like I, I started my own business, but I started my own business to not interview with people because I was so... Um, shy man I, I don't like being judged so rather than being judged just do my own thing so i did that i never told anybody how i was burned i went to college and all this stuff but never told fraternity brothers or roommates what had happened to their roommate or fraternity brother it was my story my scars my past we're not going there wow. and then two things happened over the course of three days that, that changed my life and this is the way the universe or god works i think yeah. if you're paying attention I'm 28 years old and in a church service on a Sunday, a pastor is talking about talents. Yes. And as a, as a Midwesterner, I'd always known what I had, one talent. Intellectually, you and I share that. You talk about being the least intelligent in your family, me too. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not that intelligent. I'm not that good looking. I'm not that athletic. I'm not that driven. All these things, I'm not. So I'm not, I'm not talented. So he says, if you got five, double, three, multiply, one. Now he's looking at me. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how you're called to do something with that talent. And he gave us a pathway forward to multiply that talent, to do, to do something mighty with the gifts we have. Even if it's only one gift, do something, man, mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. And if, for those of you in the audience, if you've ever been in a big room, but it seems like someone's looking at you when they're talking, yeah. like this pastor's looking at me. Mm -hmm. Two days later, I'm working, I, I, I'm doing construction at that time. I ran my own development business. Which is hilarious to me, by the way. You're burned, you've had amputations, you don't have your fingers. You decide to be in carpentry or like uh, construction, which I think is just another part of the story that's great, but go ahead. Well, it's ridiculous. It, it, it was the way without knowing it, because I'm not that self-aware of proving to the world I'm worthy. Yeah. 
but I can't prove it yet to myself when I don't recognize I'm already worthy. Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to prove it to everybody else, man. So just look at what I'm doing now. I'm building, I'm on a ladder, I'm earning all these things. I'm proving you how normal I am, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't, and I, I'm not, I'm not confident. That's for sure. And on that Tuesday morning, my phone rings and it's a little girl. And she says, Mr. O'Leary, would you speak at my school? And Ed, I, I've never spoken anywhere, but I said, yes. On the heels of that conversation from Sunday, where if you have one talent, multiply it. Okay. So I said yes to this little girl. I practiced a talk for 40 hours, walked in front of this room, had my notes in front of me, never looked up at the little monsters. And that's my first gig, man. Three Girl Scouts in St. Louis County wasn't even paid with a box of Samoas. So there's no income, man, coming out of this thing. Oh my gosh. And on the walk out, these little girls are hugging me, which was sweet. And then one of the dads says, dude, that was, that was killer. Would you speak at my Kiwanis meeting? Never heard of Kiwanis, but I'll, yeah, I'll go. One of those guys was a Rotarian. One of those guys was Chamber of Commerce. And we just kept saying yes. No goal in mind. And I know you're a big goals guy, me too. Mm -hmm. But the goal back then was to be open to, open to yes. Yes. Open to and it led over time, and if you want to rewind and ask more about it, we can, but it led to 2,500 events, a couple million people live, tens of millions virtually, by being willing to vulnerably say yes to that first group of three Girl Scouts. Yep. Well, and also say yes to, hey, here's my scars. Here's my pain. I think that, you know, it's been said on my show multiple times that we're most qualified to help the person we used to be. And- <laughs> And That's awesome. there's a great saying also about, listen, if you really want to impress people, try to show them how perfect you are or normal you are to your language. But if you really want to impact people, reveal to them your imperfections. Mm -hmm. And I don't think enough times in life, we, I, I, I want my audience to understand this. Your imperfections right. are your pathway to you creating change in your own life and other people's lives. If you'll just accept that. And by the way, it doesn't mean we don't work on our weaknesses. What I'm saying to you is that that's which that's your special that's right. when we were talking earlier about you know well my family's average and ordinary you know what i meant and i know what you meant and i'm saying that the average ordinary people like myself like you that have had something special happen in their life the irony is the pathway is their mistake is their scar is their setback and so look at that area of your life and decide what can you do with it and I'm going to tell you, not all the people that win in life are six foot four and hit, you know, run a four, four, 40 and could dunk a basketball or are supermodels. That's a really small group of the happy and successful people in life. 99.9% .9 of the happy and successful people in life are average and ordinary people who have done extraordinary things in very simple ways. I'm curious though, um, didn't your parents write a book about this, which is sort of what sort of, again, your parents get, kind of had to nudge you out there one way or the other, this story was going to get out there, or do I have the sequence incorrect? No, you're right. And that's how the okay. little girl heard about it. So um, okay. my mom and dad always wondered how their child's story would end. Mm -hmm. and for the parents in the room, you, you understand what I'm talking about. They're like, how does this, this thing go down? And they weren't sure, even as I'm progressing through grade school, middle school, high school, into college. And on the day you and I are recording this, it's November 22nd as we record, mm -hmm. it's the anniversary of the day my wife, Elizabeth Grace, and I married. So this Come is our 19th anniversary. But Happy mom anniversary. And dad, wow. Dude, I'm honored. Mm -hmm. So um, they're in church the night that their son is on the altar wearing this goofy looking tuxedo that doesn't fit right. <laughs> and then they look behind them and they see this girl in white with brown hair and brown eyes and she's stunning she's gorgeous walking toward the altar and then they see us take hands and my hands are broken and hers are perfect but we say i do and we kiss and we turn around and we walk down this aisle and that's the first time they recognize how the story ends it's actually just how it begins mm -hmm. but the painful story of their of their nine-year-old son being burned in it beautifully with the beautiful lady and an incredible life in front of them so they start writing about this. My dad got Parkinson's, he lost his business, he lost his job, he lost income, he retreats home, writes a little story of his life mm -hmm. called Overwhelming Odds. And they, they write about the miracle they got when they turned this thing, this hopeless story over to God, and they got their son back in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. So they print 100 copies, Ed, only 100 copies, man. Mm -hmm. It's the unauthorized biography of John O'Leary's life. They, they, they wrote it. 100 people buy it. Then another 100. Then another 100. They go on to sell, I think, 85,000 copies. Come on. That's I, amazing. 
no marketing plan, no goals, no savvy out of their garage from my father's wheelchair, people coming. It was oh, just a beautiful my. grace filled story. Yeah. One of the puppies was sold to a girl scout. And she's the one that says after reading it, which you share your story. Mm -hmm. So if you take this thing all the way back, like how, how does the universe or how does God work? Mm -hmm. My dad wrote that book because he lost his gig because he had Parkinson's disease. And you're, you're big into using your challenges yes. for something bigger than the, the day. Yes. Leading you somewhere, man. Mm -hmm. That addiction is leading you somewhere. That divorce is leading you somewhere. That first bankruptcy is leading you somewhere. That burn at age nine is leading you somewhere. Quit looking at yourself as a victim to it. Ask yourself what you can do to redeem it. So dad gets this diagnosis, writes a book, has no idea that it's going to be lead ultimately to you and me being on this podcast today. My gosh. But he says yes. And that's the that's the key in life. Say yes. Mm, my gosh. You guys, his father gets Parkinson's, writes the book, forces him to go speak to this little girl's group. <laughs> and here we are. And by the way, all of it go all the way back is 730 in the morning where he messes with his gas can and Jim <laughs> saves his life. It's unreal. Yet, guys, your story becomes special if you win. <laughs> if you win. If he didn't win, if he didn't marry this beautiful woman, if he didn't turn his life into something, then it's a totally different story. So you all get to determine. You are the author. You and God are the author of your own life. You determine the next chapters. You determine what it means. And ultimately, what you do with it, do you eat your potatoes, <laughs> right? Determines, do you want to live? Because I'm going to tell you the other thing, what made me emotional. This question, I want to go back, man, and you'll use this when you speak. When your mother says, do you want to die? I think a lot of you need to ask yourself that question right now. Are you living? I'm not talking about your heart beating. You know exactly what I mean. There's that great saying that says most people die at 22 or 23 years old. We just don't get around to burying them until they're <laughs> 65 or 70. So those of you listening to this, are you living? Do you want to die? You know what I mean by that? I mean, do you want to live? Because what John's response was, no, mom, I want to live. I don't want to die. Maybe it's time you ask yourself this question. What does living mean to you? Mm. What is your calling? What is your purpose? What are the scars you need to reveal? What is the redemptive story you have? And here's a pathway for it. And I've never heard someone say this before. I'm reading and I'm like, man, I actually said to our mutual friend who introduced us, John, I said, man, what an optimistic guy. And then I'm reading your work. And you're like, uh, I don't just believe in optimism. You talk about pragmatic positivity. What the heck is that? So the guy you mentioned is John Rulin, who is just yes. such a good man. So I wonderful, love him. wonderful human. And I'm grateful he made the introduction. I get in trouble a bunch by being the optimistic guy, by squeezing enough lemons, adding a tiny bit of sugar, mixing that up with a little bit of water and having myself a delicious lemonade. And people remind me how hard life is. And I always say, yeah, yeah. and I don't run from that. I don't hide from the difficulties of life, but rather than just talking about how bad it is, I like when people are moving toward the struggles and making it better. Yes. So yeah, am I optimistic? Yeah, pragmatically so. Because what I do is rather than just looking at how bad the world is, which any fool can do and they do, and if you don't believe me, watch your evening news tonight. Yep. They will tell you how bad everything is. Yep. What they miss is the arc of history. The reality is this, in our individual lives, and certainly in our collective ones, things are better today by a lot than they were 10 years ago, mm -hmm. shockingly better than they were 20, 50, 100, 1,000, 10,000, give me any measurement, and we are far better off today as a society mm -hmm. than we've ever been in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can talk about how bad the environment is and how bad things are racially in an environment. Like, yes, these things need to be redeemed. We need to discuss and work to make it better. And then take a deep breath and say, and it is getting better. And we are working to make it better, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. Yep. So pragmatic optimism is moving forward with a heavy dose of hope, but also bowied by the fact that we are doing far better today than we were yesterday. And it's our job to make it better for those who come behind us. See, I love that. See, one thing when you start saying, hey, uh, don't be a victim, someone will say back to you, well, no, you don't understand my situation. Um, you know, my dad was a drug addict or alcoholic. I was burned. I come from a marginalized racial community where I am behind the eight ball. I don't have the opportunities you have, or I, I grew up poor. I didn't get to go to good schools that you went to, or, um, you know, I don't look like everybody looks like and or whatever that situation is. What I'm saying to you is 
I may not understand those things, and I'm going to assume you're right about them. Yeah. I'm assuming you're right about them. In fact, many of you, I know you're right about them. The question is, is that going to define the rest of your life? That's the question. Is that the definition of you? And so accepting truth is my father was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I did have a rough little time there, right? You were burned on 100% of your body below the neck, right? Like, okay, that's true. You ought, you were born into a group of people that have been um, taken advantage of, abused, whatever it might be. That is, these things are true. Yes. These are not, someone's not, when someone says you're not a victim, they're not saying your circumstances aren't true. They are true. You are right. The question is now what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Is it going to be a redemptive story? And what if more and more people that were children of alcoholics shared it and prevailed? What if more and more people from a marginalized racial or economic or religious community shared it and won anyway? Isn't that sort of how it would change? Yes. Isn't that sort of how it changes? Otherwise, it's a permanent definition of your life. So am I, am I, would you, would you second that the way that I said it? It's right on the way we change the world. We think it's going to be in DC or Jefferson city or Sacramento. And that is part of it, no doubt. But the real way we make the change is you make your bed, you look in the mirror, you fix the hair. If you have any hair left over, and then you attack the day. So you start in your own backyard, you start at home and then you work outward from there. So that's where the beachhead begins. And then we move onward and we do so together. Yeah. You say in your book, the in awe book, um, rediscover your childlike wonder, unleash inspiration, meaning, and joy. This has always been hard for me because my childhood was not, by the way, my mom listens to this mom. I had a great childhood. It always bugs my mom. She's like, you know, was it that bad? No, there were just elements that weren't good. I come from a very loving family and my mom, like your mom, is a world-class human being. Thank God for my mom. What fascinated me about you I was doing research because you're this super positive dude. People think I am too. And privately, people that know me very well know that doesn't come natural to me. I'm sort of a natural, I don't know if it's a natural, but like I, I can very easily gravitate to be a very pessimistic person. I have to work on being positive. It's sort of a muscle I built. And I've heard you said the same about you. Is that really true? A guy writes all this stuff about being positive? It is true. It's ironic that I, I do this work because I am not naturally positive. I grew up in Long Island, New York in a Jewish Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of guilt, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of wine, a lot of whining. And so my mom was Jewish. Uh, dad was an Italian New York City police officer, undercover mm -hmm. narcotics. And so he was a badass and a loving guy, but just probably one of the most negative people on the planet. You'd get up in the morning, hey, good morning, dad. He'd say, what's so good about it? <laughs> and so I think- And his son up, turns out to be you. Yes, yeah, so, so growing up in that, in that family, right? You grow up with more of a, you know, a negative mindset and not, not a lot of positivity. So I think naturally, I just naturally have always gone towards the negative. Mm. And I've had to work really hard at being positive, but it's actually led me to do this work because you know, I want to be more positive. My wife threatened to leave me, you know, years ago, I was 31 years old, life was falling apart. And she said, if you don't change, like we're over, I am sick of this. I'm not going to deal with your negativity anymore. You're ruining our marriage. You're ruining our life. Like that's it. And so she gave me that ultimatum. She brought the hammer down and that really began the journey of saying, okay, I got to work at, at changing this. That's bizarre. That's it's amazing to me because it's really what you're known for. Kind of, I am too. I think it gives people hope because, you know, I'd go to events, you know, even personal development events, everyone's jumping up and down, you know, and I'm like, this is just not me, you know? And over time I built, I think a lot of people that listen to personal development are like, I don't know if I'm like all these people. Maybe they're just different than me. We're not different than you. We've built some skills up. We've had some breakthroughs in our thinking for both you and I, our faith is central in that. Is there something specific you started to do? Like, could you, like, I, I read about the, the, there's these five D's you teach. It's sort of interconnected to this. Give us some, some tactical, some granular stuff maybe on this topic. Well, what happened to me years ago was I actually started to take a walk of gratitude. So every day I would take a thank you walk. A walk. I read that, yeah, I read that you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. Mm -hmm. So right after my wife almost left me, I started taking these walks every day. It was like a 10 minute walk, then a 20 minute walk. And ultimately an hour walk. And so I would just say what I'm thankful for. And when you're doing that, you're flooding your brain with these emotions and this positive energy that uplifts you rather than the stress hormones that slowly drain you. So it's your brain and your body that you're doing this with. 
And over time, right, you create a fertile mind that's ready for great things to happen. Do it one day, it's not going to do a whole lot, but do it for a week, right? Mm -hmm. Think about your mind like a garden. And so you do it for a week. You weed the negative, you feed the positive. A month, the garden starts to look pretty good. Do it for a year. Wow. It starts to look amazing. And now for me, it's been over 15 years that I've been doing this. And so gratitude has been the number one thing. Now, those walks turned into walks of prayer. They turn to walks of, of faith where I start to just pray, surrender, trust. It's on those walks. The ideas for these books came to me and through me, I started to write these books, right? So it really changed my life. Just taking that time every day mm -hmm. for those walks. Now, I also believe you got to feed the positive on a daily basis. And the best advice I've ever heard is from Dr. James Gills, the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons. That's a double iron man, which means you do an iron man a day later, do another one. And the last time he did, it, he was 59 years old. So he was asked how he did it. He said this, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. Oh. He said, if I listen, you know, I hear all the fear, all the negativity, all the doubt, all the reasons why I can't finish this race. But if I talk to myself, I could feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. Now he would memorize and recite scripture that's what fueled him. But I tell people all the time, like, if you're not a believer, you can still share encouraging words for yourself and to yourself that allows you to move forward instead of listening to all the negative thoughts. And you know, and I know those negative thoughts are lies, right? They would, they're, they're not something we would choose for ourselves. Negative thoughts do not come from you. When I work with professional athletes, I ask them all the time, hey, do your negative thoughts come from you? And they say, yeah, yeah. I said, really? Who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Did you ever choose a negative thought? And then they go, no, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so if you wouldn't choose it, where's it coming from? Mm -hmm. And so then you can teach them that's coming from consciousness. It comes from a spiritual place. It's a spiritual battle. And those thoughts, just like when we're dreaming or having a nightmare, we're not choosing those thoughts. When you're driving your car and a thought pops in your head, you didn't choose that thought. But when those negative thoughts come in, you do not have to listen to them. Don't believe the lies. What you want to do is speak truth to the lies. And that's what I've done over the years. That like literally that truth changed my life. Speaking truth, not listening to the negative thoughts, not allowing those thoughts to condemn me, to hold me back, not allowing those thoughts to keep me from being who God has called me to be. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you walk in that truth, you walk in that power and that changes everything. Boy, that's so, I want to unpack that. That was, that's one of those things. Sometimes on the show lately, I've had this tendency of to be, okay, go rewind like go listen to that again. That's, that's a that's a double listener one. A couple of things you said there, I just want to kind of confirm and 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 tell you that one, I've always said, you know, you don't have to believe everything you think. You know, everything you're saying thinking is true. The second thing is when you're on these walks and you're you're beginning to take control of what you're looking for, it's part of your brain is, and I know you know this, but I'm just sharing this with the audience, it's called the reticular activating system, which is it's the filter of your life. It's what you see things through. So if you were growing up in a pessimistic environment where the negatives are, you've been programmed to see, hear, feel, think things that are negative. When you begin to take control of these thoughts, these words you say, you're literally reprogramming the filter for your life. It's a very real thing. It's changing the matrix of your life. Mm. And God gave you that reticular activating system. So it's connected to your spirituality. The third thing I just want to tell you, brother, that's so awesome, is talk. Um, one thing I've never shared on the show, but I talk to myself. I mean, like out loud, like a crazy person. When you were a little boy or a little girl, most of you, you talked to yourself a lot. Like if I walked in your bedroom and you were alone, you know this, you're all nodding. You were talking to yourself. There's power in that. Children understand that. There's a spiritual connection to the spoken word. It's a prayer. To this day, I still do it. I got to tell you this really quick and I'll go to my next question, but it just happened. And I do this a lot. I mean, like, like a little boy, I talk to myself still like a crazy person. I'll even interview myself. I know that sounds nuts, but it's, I take control of my words. I'm, I'm at a gas station about three weeks ago. I'm pumping gas. And I went into my little thing where I'm talking to me. There's this guy that pulls up in a car and he's staring at me. I'm not paying any attention. I'm still talking to myself. And the guy that walks by me, looks at me, goes, Ed? <laughs> I'm in the middle of talking to myself. Like I, literally like a delusional person he's thinking. And it's, it was a good friend of mine from college. We hadn't seen each other in 25 years. He's like, I'm so proud of what you're doing. How you doing, brother? I'm like, this dude just literally caught me. <laughs> with the proverbial pants down of talking to myself, but I don't give a crap. It works. And so I want to acknowledge what John said there. What, um, you've written so many books on so many things, but I guess I want to ask you in that, the thinking realm, 
but as it connects to leadership, you mentioned a minute ago, John speaks to all kinds, you know, Dabo Sweeney, Clemson football, who I think, you know, he and Saban arguably are the two greatest, you know, Urban Meyer, my good friend, if he's listening to this, you're there too, Urban, but you're not active. So Dabo Sweeney is arguably the greatest college football coach in the world. One of the two, you work with the Niners, you've worked with all kinds of different professional sports teams. What is something about a guy like Dabo Sweeney or these elite coaches? What do they do in their environment that's different that you see as a leader? It's the way they build their culture and it's the way that they lead. I mean, you cannot separate the leader from the culture. It's the leader that drives the culture. So who stirs the pot determines what is in the pot. And it's the love that he put, puts into it. It's the energy, it's the passion, it's the drive, it's the quest for excellence that leads that program that creates success. Like Dabo is incredible. One of the greatest leaders I've ever been around, not just a football coach, but a leader. And he leads with such optimism and belief and faith. When he got that job, he literally brought in two signs to his meeting. One was believe and the other one was I can't with the T crossed out. He knew that Clemson always had talent, but they didn't have belief. And so he was able to instill that belief in his program. And after every practice, he gives a speech to his team. It's like a brainwashing session where every day he's like, we're the best, we're gonna do this. And he's always instilling belief in his team. So leadership is a transfer of belief. Mm -hmm. And so every day he's transferring his belief to his team. And then you can see how they start to believe over time. It's incredible. Now he also leads with love and accountability. Like that's essential. The greatest leaders lead with both love and accountability, the combination of the two. Too much accountability, not enough love. You're always driving, you're always pushing, and a lot of leaders do that. And eventually you will burn your team out and they will tune you out. And so you have to make sure that you are leading with love first. They have to know you care about them. You're encouraging them, you, you believe in them, you're supporting them, but then you hold them accountable to the standards, to the culture, to the quality of what you expect this program to be and this culture to be about. And so it's the combination of the two. Again, too much love, you're a wonderful family. Everyone gets along, but you're not allowing them or causing them to be great. You're actually holding them back mm -hmm. if you have too much love, not enough accountability. Because if you really love someone, you won't let them settle for anything but their best. So, so great coaches are always relentlessly focusing on the culture with their principles, their standards, and they're constantly loving their players, investing in them, and also holding them accountable to what they expect and the standards of the program. Do you think in his case that, um, and in other leaders' cases, he's bold about his faith with, I assume, his team too, because he does this publicly. And I wonder if you just speak to that for a minute. I'm a real believer that people want to know what you stand for. And they don't even have to necessarily agree with what you stand for, but they want you to be a definable person because I think it creates trust that they at least know who you are. Am I right? Outside looking, it looks to me like he's bold about his faith with his team and they know what he stands for. He's very bold and they do know what he stands for. And he does lead with his faith. And a lot of guys on the team aren't believers and that's okay with him. Like he, he's not here to, to convince anyone. He just lives his faith and they feel his faith. And so a lot of guys actually come to faith by being part of that program, but he's not driving that in, in any inappropriate way, but he does lead with faith and it is contagious and they know what he stands for. I mean, he is very clear what he stands for. And everyone thinks, okay, he's this positive guy and he's has fun yeah. all the time. You know, no, there is a drive towards excellence with him. And if you are not giving your best, he will call you out. I've been in meetings. I've been at practices where, man, you wouldn't think that was very positive based on that practice, really? Really? but he is driving that person and that player and that team to be great. So he's got the combination. Oh, and also he, he's really big on relationships. Like he says, Hey, we have a process like Saban, Nick Saban, he has a process. Alabama is all about the process. Dab was like, we have relationships that drive the process. We are relationships first. And then that drives our process to be successful. So good. So, so good. I, I love the insight about special leaders. And, and I know, you know, everyone, he's being humble, but he's worked with that program for quite a long time. John has. So obviously coach Sweeney has a, a level of trust and belief in you that he's transferred as well. You got to tell him this because it's one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. I know it's not yours, but in terms of being a leader, developing leaders, the carrot egg coffee bean, you sure. got to tell us guys, get ready, man. I just love this story. Damon West and I met through Dabo Sweeney. Damon had just spoken to the team and I show up and Dabo Sweeney said to me, Hey, we just had this guy, Damon West speak. 
and he talked about the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. And Dabo literally starts to reenact Damon's talk for me, like in his office. It's hilarious. <laughs> and he starts going through it. And as he starts teaching me the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean, I'm like, man, that is an incredible story. And so we decided to write a book based on that. I called up Damon. I said, hey, this needs to be a book. I had a vision for it immediately as Dabo was telling me about it. And it's really simple. When you put a carrot into boiling hot water, what happens to the carrot? It gets softened. It gets weakened by its environment. You put an egg into boiling hot water, what happens to the egg? It gets hardened, right? And so we can be like the carrot when we are dealing with hot water, difficult situations, tough circumstances, like we're dealing with right now. We can crumble from the inside out. We can allow the fear, the anxiety, the stress to get the best of us. Or we can become hardened, bitter, angry, frustrated, where we just don't care anymore. And a lot of people right now are just saying, I don't care where they're just angry. So we can be like both. We don't wanna be like either though. What we wanna be like is the coffee bean. You put that coffee bean into boiling hot water, what happens? It transforms the water into coffee. It transforms the environment. It's not impacted by its environment. Instead, it transforms its environment. And that is our opportunity. That is our power. That is our charge every day. As positive leaders, as positive teammates, we can impact the environments we're in. We don't have to be the victim of our circumstance. I know you teach a lot about this and I love the way you teach it. We can actually transform our situation, transform our environment. And in doing so, that's, that's how we're gonna impact the world. Pessimists don't change the world. Naysayers say you can't do it. Complainers complain about problems, but they don't solve them. We know that throughout history, mm -hmm. it's the positive leaders, the believers, the dreamers, the doers who have the greatest impact. And it's all about being a coffee bean. Be like the coffee bean. I wish I knew that story when my kids were younger because I'd have told them it over and over and over again and said, be like the coffee bean. I'd have said that a thousand times to my kids. It's so good. When I heard it, man, it wasn't for me. Got to give Damon all the credit. He heard it from a guy named Mr. Jackson in prison. That's a whole other story of oh Mr. Gosh. Jackson who told him this story. That's how he survived prison. Gets out in seven years, was a 65-year sentence. He had gotten addicted to meth mm. and was burglarizing homes. Then he gets out in seven years and said, I just want to be useful. God calls him to go to speak to these teams. Dabo gives him a shot. He's the only coach who gave him a shot when he asked like hundreds of coaches. Dabo gave him a shot. And now he's impacting Alabama, Georgia, all so these awesome. teams. It's been pretty cool. And then I've been able to share this story and this message with a lot of teams. I was, just, I was with Jay Glazer last night. We were talking about his impact with veterans coming back from the, from the war and the depression they deal with. And think about that. When you're dealing with all this adversity, all these challenges, this simple analogy can help you overcome. And like you said, with kids, man, kids need this message now more than ever. Yeah. The other thing you teach is a word for the year. Tell them about this. Like, what I love about John, guys, is you know, a lot of people that talk on leadership or being positive, it's just statements. You have actionable things people can do. So tell them about that for a second. Yeah, because it's all about the action, right? Words without action lead to nothing, right? So we make it. So I don't think that was very profound, but I think it's true, right? And so if you don't have action, you can't get things done. So, so yeah, this one word, again, good friends of mine, Dan and Jimmy, they've been doing it for over 20 years now. They told me about how every year they pick a word for the year. So we wrote a book called One Word That Will Change Your Life. And we've been working with all these teams. Every year, Dabo picks his word. Sean McVay picks his word. I work with the Dodgers. They pick their word. It's really cool when a team does it. And that word is meant to fuel you for the year. It gives you meaning and mission, passion and purpose. So in January, great time to do it. You pick your word for the year that you're going to focus on. And that word becomes like a rallying cry. It becomes something that you could focus on and Zoom focus on to, to win each day. So words for me have been like serve and and rise and surrender. I'll never forget the word surrender. It was a tough year, but that word came up for me and God always gives me a word. I always say, pray on your word, say, I'm open. And that word will come. I've had atheist friends say they were just open and said, okay, I'm open. And the word just came. And the more you're open, the word will come for you that is meant for you. And then that word will shape you and mold you to be who you're meant to be that year. My word was heart this year. And I gotta tell you with everything happening, I went back to that word in terms of, I wanna lead with heart, I wanna love with all my heart, I wanna speak from the heart, right? And I feel like I've been more powerful than ever than in just focusing on that and really coming from the heart instead of just you know, going through the motions, instead of being tired and, and allowing the, the circumstances to drain you, right? Just come with that heart. And it's been an incredible year in, in terms of all the adversity we're facing, but, but the heart has, has taken me through it. How have you done with that? I'm just curious. I mean, everybody, just so you know, I mean, John has businesses, but he's a speaker, right? And so, right. Oh, yeah. I mean, this has been a difficult time. I mean, uh, this is not like, 
you know, mamsy, pamsy, fluffy stuff we're talking about here. John's had to apply these things. I'm just curious if you had, if you had a bunch of down days, what do you do when you have them and what's it been like for you? Man, Ed, that's such a great question. Cause when it first hit, I, I have to admit, I had a down couple of days. I was like, what is going on? My world was shook. Cause you know, I don't have uh, a financial company like you have in terms of that, that background. I really have put everything into my writing and speaking. I sold my businesses to focus 100% on this. So we were doing a lot of consulting and training and speaking and everything just sort of dried up. And so I was talking to a Navy SEAL named Chad Wright, former Navy SEAL. I don't know if you know Chad, but we were talking you know and, and, and he said, you know, a lot of guys don't make it through Hell Week and they don't make it through Hell Week to, do, to be a Navy SEAL because they're longing for it to be over. They're dreaming for it to end. He said, the ones who make it just want to make it to breakfast. And when he told me that, I knew I had the recipe for winning during this time. It was to win today, to not worry about tomorrow, but just win today. So I woke up every day just saying, okay, I'm going to stay positive. I'm going to try to encourage other people and I'm going to get better every day. And I'm going to reach out to clients and whoever reaches out to me, I'm going to help them. And I had so many people reach out. I reached out to various clients. I spoke to the Timberwolves and various teams and coaches and Fortune 500 companies and had these incredible conversations with the leaders. It's amazing how many things came my way as a result of that attitude. I had an incredible year financially. I have to admit, I don't want to, I don't want to, because um, I know a lot of people haven't. So I don't want to yeah. brag about it. I want to brag on God because I really believe that my faith grew so much during that time because I was humbled because I had nowhere to go but to pray. And I really said, God, I trust in you. Whatever your plan is, I trust. I'm going to serve. And I went back to my rookie mindset when I first started doing this years ago, when I went on a book tour to 28 cities where five people showed up and 10 people showed up and 20 people showed up. The most people we had were 100 people in Des Moines, Iowa. They thought Jeff Gordon was coming. That's why they showed up. And that's not a joke. That is a true story. <laughs> <laughs> they think they're getting a NASCAR driver and you show up. I love it. Yeah. And uh, I, I came home and it wasn't a great tour. And it was my beginning, right? Energy bus had just come out. It took five years for the energy bus to be a bestseller. Now Did it over, really? Yeah. Now it sold over 2 million copies, but five wow. years uh, back then. And I remember that time. So I went back to that time mm. and I just said, show up, be a coffee, bean, make a difference. And it was amazing, all the events that happened, all the virtual keynotes, all the, all the clients that I helped, all the free stuff I did. I did a ton of free stuff to serve and then to see that come back tenfold. See, people always think, right, you have to go out there with the idea of, okay, how much money can I make? And yes, we're here to make money because you have to make profit to be able to, to have an existing business, to have a growing business, to help others, right? But I have found that if you love serving care, if you truly love, serve, and care, your business will exponentially grow. And I was returned to that rookie mindset where that was my focus, a lot of trust, a lot of prayer. And my faith grew so deep during that time where I truly relied on God for what was going on. And it's amazing what happened. So I, I'm going to write about more about it because there's so much more to share. I don't want to share it because of what people are going through. But there's so many more things that happened where I just saw it wasn't me. I just saw that it was an incredible miracle of all the things that happened. Yeah, we both have that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. We both have that in common where we're both very aware of uh, how average Jordan we are and how great God has been to both of Amen. us. Which we're going we're gonna to get to your faith in a minute. But before that, Nurse, David Nurse has been on my show, our mutual friend. We, I want to go back to that beginning because you touched on the topic. He's like, you got to ask him about being an international speaker in the very <laughs> beginning. I, this is awesome for people that are startup entrepreneurs or that want to change their identity or change their life. This is just awesome right here. Remember, context, guys. Spoken in front of millions of people, sought after by professional sports teams in all different sports, 23 some odd books, millions of books sold, you know, made tons of money doing this, impacted all these people. <laughs> he was an international speaker. I was cracking up when I heard this. Yeah, so we went from all these cities, 28 cities. And so uh, Daniel Decker, who I'm sure you know Daniel, Daniel basically was calling all these different cities and radio stations. Hey, John Gordon's coming. Yeah, he's internationally known. He's, he's internationally known. I had one friend in London and the energy bus had become a huge hit in South Korea. You know, not North Korea, but South Korea was like this big hit, not in the US, 
but for some reason in, in South Korea it became a hit. So we were saying internationally known. My publisher was calling me the David Hasselhoff of Korea because <laughs> no one was reading my book in the US, but I was huge in South Korea. <laughs> oh, hadn't you only been out of the country like on a one week vacation or something like that at that no, time? Yeah, I, I never went to I never even went to South Korea. I can't explain what why it took off. But so we were saying internationally known and everywhere we went, they're like they would interview me. Hey, John Gordon's here, he's internationally known. <laughs> And so, uh, oh, so that, that was the beginning tour that we went on. And, uh, you know, you look back on that, you're right. And it's like, hey, you got to believe it. I'm not a big believer in fake it till you make it. I'm a big yeah. believer in believe it because you belong. Believe it because what you believe determines what you create. And so I was believing it. Yeah, I think I just, I'm not kidding you. I may have torn ab right there. I, at least I pulled it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> laughing. Um, you know, I don't believe in fake it till you make it either. But what I do believe in is creating a frame for yourself that's new, a new frame that you live in, a new character that you're going to be. And as long as you're authentic and have those standards and there's congruency, guess what? He's become an international speaker. He's become an internationally well-known author. So it's very, very true. Well, we've been kind of building up to this. And it's one of the things I've been fascinated to ask you personally, too. So as I understand the story, you, you've said openly, hey, I wasn't that great of a husband for many, many years. And or at least for a few years, I guess. And um, you were your wife gives you this ultimatum. But we wouldn't be doing a John Gordon interview if we weren't talking about faith and how that's impacted your life and changed your life. So how did you come to your faith? And in general, to begin with, what does it mean to you? Yeah, it's everything to me. And while I work with all these companies and sports teams, and I'm not always actively right talking about my faith at events and things like that it is what drives me. And it's the cornerstone of, of my life. It's my foundation. Because for years, I didn't have faith. And for years, I struggled with fear and anxiety and stress. And I, I tried all these things. And I practiced Buddhism. And I did meditation. And I was a bit I was I was really big into Buddhism and, and new age philosophy and Deepak Chopra, and did all of that years ago, my wife and I were really into that. And it helped me along the way it was part of my spiritual journey. So I never poo poo it. I believe everyone is on a journey. And it was a big part of, of who I was and helped me become who I was meant to be. But there came a point where I couldn't deal with the pain, and the burden, and the wounds that I had felt of the past, and the anxiety and all the things that were holding me back from being who I was meant to be. And then Daniel Decker gave me a sermon from Erwin McManus. That really spoke to me. I know you had Erwin on on your podcast. And Erwin didn't even know him, but his message, the way he spoke about Jesus really spoke to me. And for the first time, I heard the voice of Jesus. For the first time, it spoke to my heart. Now, I had always grown up, you know, again, Jewish. Mom is Jewish and Jesus was Jewish, but he was a, a prophet. Mm -hmm. He was a great teacher. He wasn't a savior. But when I heard Erwin's message, I remember saying to God, God, if there is something to this Jesus, I'm open. I'm open. Just show me the signs. And then everywhere I went, I started seeing signs. I would meditate and see a glowing cross. And it was unbelievable. I can't explain it. I would see a glowing cross. And I'm driving down to Orlando. And as I'm driving, looking to the left, I heard this audible. It said, look. And I turned to the right. And there's a huge sign that said, Jesus is the answer. Crazy. So I come back, I go to see this Buddhist energy healer. I was having problems with my stomach and this guy was great, Don Van Vliet. And I go see Don and I tell Don about these signs. He's like, oh yeah. He goes, well, I'm a Buddhist. I'm trying to attain enlightenment on my own. I want to see if I can do it by myself. He said, but with, with Jesus, all you do is believe and receive. You see, he takes your heavy vibrational energy. He takes your soul pain. He goes, Christians call it sin. He goes, you can't connect to a perfect, harmonious, energetic God if you have heavy vibrational energy. I wrote the energy bus. I always saw the world in terms of energy. That's what spoke to me. I said, can I take someone else's soul pain? He said, can you handle your own? I walked out of there believing in a God that would want to take my burden, my pain. And he said, Christianity is like spiritual cheating, which is funny, spiritual cheating. He said, all you do is believe and receive. So I walked out of there saying, okay, I'm going to believe. And it's so crazy. I started to believe. And then I started to receive. And I didn't have all the answers. But I just said, God, strengthen my faith. And God brought one teacher, one person, one book after another in my life. And I gotta tell you, it changed my heart. It changed my soul, changed me as a husband, changed me as a man. I started writing books after that. The energy bus came after that. Mm -hmm. And I've written all these books literally in less than 
four weeks, about three and a half weeks, each book takes to write. And I got to give all credit to God. I'm not, I'm not the author, just the pen. And these ideas come to me like literally downloads. And then I just start writing them. And the fact that they've sold four and a half million copies, you know, I got to give all glory to, to him in, in doing that. And I, I know that I am nothing without my faith, without my relationship. And it's in that surrender, in that trust, in that prayer of use me for your purpose. Mm-hmm. Guide me towards my purpose. That's when God started to use me to do this work. So to try to say I'm doing it on my own, I, I just can't go in that direction because I know it's not me. And when I wrote The Garden, God revealed the five Ds to me of what everyone's going through right now with fear and anxiety. I wrote this during December 25th to January 8th. I finished it January 8th, not knowing a pandemic was coming. And yet this book talks about, it's a spiritual fable about overcoming fear, stress, and anxiety of what everyone's going through. Doubt, discouragement, distortion, lies, right? Fear is a liar, negative thoughts, distractions, and division, more division than ever. Write about these five Ds and that's what's playing out right now. And then he gave me the blueprint on how to overcome. So it just, got, it just shows you, that's like one example of, of just the ideas and how they come. I write these books and then they come out and I know that's what I'm here to do. Was there an experience early in your life that put you on this path that you're on? Like, how do you become you? <laughs> Is there something that happened? <laughs> no, no, nothing special happened. Usually people come on spiritual path that some drastic, either right. tragedy or an yeah. incident has happened. Yeah. None of those hit me. From my childhood, I knew I came for doing some work. You knew as a little boy? Did you have some special uh, insights or feelings into people. I think we all have these gifts, right? You said mine's to communicate or motivate, but certain people in certain areas, I believe, are born with an abundance of one or more of those things. So I probably was born with maybe a proclivity to communicate or speak. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Every, and so yours was did you, did you see did every you, child has that? You know, right. We all have the joy. We have all bliss. Every baby comes to this world as a bundle of joy, right. bundle of bliss. And people on the course of days, uh, uh, years, they lose it. I didn't lose it. I'm holding on to it. You've <laughs> held on to yours. Look at how joyful you are. You laugh a lot. You, you, I just feel like there's a lot of people that would listen to this and go, I don't know what mine is, though. So I, I, think, I'll, I think you would agree with me. I think a lot I think of people... it's good. You know, it's good to say, I don't know about myself rather than... Putting a label on yourself about all your limitations are, you know. Do you think, well, that's good to know. Because I think you just gave a lot of people a little uh, break right there that they're like, okay, maybe it's good that I don't know. But it wouldn't be good to end your life at the end and never figure out what it was, right? So it might be okay right now not to know because that creates curiosity. But nobody wants to get to 110 years old and go, I never figured out my purpose, (laughs) right? Nobody wants to get to there. Yeah. So is there... Is there a, a way that someone begins? No, first, the first step is to say, acknowledge that I don't know about myself or my abilities. I may have many abilities. Mm. That takes you out of your limited identity with mm. which you are crushing yourself or limiting your uh, growth mm. or limiting your um, expression of abilities that you are yeah. endowed with. Mm. A second step is to say, I can do whatever I, I decide to do, mm. whatever I wish to do. I, I think more people, I'm going to say something to you about that. I want to talk to you about this. Like I'm just going to, everyone gets to listen in to you and I talking for a minute. This okay. isn't for everybody else. I've realized in me lately, I don't know if it's growth or just change. But the parts of me, I think you need to check in on yourself from time to time and up and audit what matters now compared to before. So when I was a young man, I wanted to be successful and influential and achieve and, and um, whatever all that comes with that. Probably rich, right? Probably have money, even though I never really thought a lot about that. And... Then I got to a stage in my life that I think I'm in now where my real mission and goal is just to contribute as much as I can to other people. But there's this other part of me that now 
feels that he needs a time of rest and rediscovery and recuperation. And it's an interesting thing for me because all of my friends are still like one of the other two versions of me. And so I'm going to do this. I'm going to write this book. Where's your new book at? You haven't written your next book. And, and there's this part of my spirit that's just saying, no, this is, and I haven't know that I've done it yet, but like I, right now I feel like I'm supposed to be resting and recovering and recuperating a little bit. And it's very foreign to me because I've never allowed myself to think that before or feel those things before. And I really want to turn inward right now. And I feel like I'd be more valuable to other people going forward if I turned introspective and inward for a while. Yet I have nobody in my circle who's at that stage. It's not like I've grown out of something. I've just morphed, changed. This is very interesting and it's essential thing to, to check the burnout. Mm -hmm. You see, activity and rest, mm -hmm. they go hand in hand. It's not that you first achieve success and then one day you will come and rest. Rest will help you to achieve things in much more effortless and efficient manner. Yeah. What you would put, uh, you know, yourself so much mm -hmm. and still your success is less, that, that means that you have not rested enough. You have not taken that inner look. Right. See? So they are complementary. They appear to be opposite. But they're complementary. Mm. Mm. Now, there are two types of joy. One joy is you achieve something, you success. When you get something, you have you're happy, okay. right? And you get a present on the Christmas Eve or sure. your birthday, and then you are all curious to open mm. it. And you know there is a joy in getting. Mm. That's an infant joy. We have all grown with that joy. Mm -hmm. But there is another joy. That comes to you when you give. Yeah. The joy of a grandmother. I often say the joy of a grandfather, grandmother is in when they give to the kids and they, in the joy of them, they find their own joy. Yes. So we have to grow from the joy of grabbing and getting to joy of giving, mm. contributing. Mm. That would bring immense satisfaction. And it will, it is restful too. You're right. That was really good right there. That was really, really good right there. You also say, don't sit around and analyze yourself too much, which I think is interesting coming from a guru, <laughs> right? Like you don't sit around too much because does that mean if you, you just become so self-involved, if you analyze too much your own life, that you can almost become, yeah, it almost becomes yeah. an ego thing. What do you mean when you say that? Because I think, I think there's a community of people, I think you'd agree with me, there's a bunch of people in the world that are just go, 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 and they don't take any time whatsoever to give themselves the gift of self-reflection analysis. Then there's another group of people that all they're doing is analyzing themselves constantly, and they're not getting around to doing a whole lot, right? <laughs> it's like chewing the, it's like chewing gum. You're chewing it and not getting anything out of it. <laughs> it's all patterns and thoughts and they come and they go, you know. It's mm -hmm. just in a field. Places impact you, people impact your thought process and all that. And why do you have to analyze so much and identify yourself with those thoughts? Yeah. You know, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. I said, just move on. Just keep moving. Keep moving. So you talk about this guy last year who won the Nobel Prize in physics, and basically his overall belief system was, none of this is real, <laughs> right? So we, <laughs> I want you to talk about this because it's kind of the guy won the Nobel Prize in physics, and his basically his conclusion is three scientists, three, three right? of them said that. Tell us about that. Tell us about that. Uh, well, this has been said in ancient philosophy long time back. You know, the world is like a dream. It's unreal. Mm. What is real is within you. Mm. So realize that something in you which doesn't change mm. and you will realize everything else is uh, temporary. I and it, the fact stays on your face and nothing mm. is permanent. See, mm. our thoughts are not there all the time. Mm. Our thoughts are not, you know, and emotions are changing. Our body is changing. You get wrinkles, you get whatever Botak and all that you do, still it is changing. <laughs> right. right. You're right. You, um, 
you've lived an amazing life. And I'm curious, what do you believe is on the other side of this? That's a surprise. Let us keep some surprise. Why do you want to know everything right away? Right, right. So you're okay with not knowing every element of it? I don't need to analyze that. I know because I've, mm -hmm. you know, when you go deep within yourself, you know that there is something that is that goes from life to life. But don't you think that that's the? Here's why I ask it. I think it's the. I think it's the primary question that human beings live with since the day they were born. Is what does this mean? Is this real? Where that's am I going? Good. That, that's a good question to have. Mm -hmm. This question uh, helps us like a vehicle to move where we want to go, the spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. We should not be in a hurry to find an answer for it. Mm -hmm. Who am I? What do I want? Where do I go? What is the purpose of my life? These questions themselves removes all the cobwebs on our path. Mm -hmm. It makes our, it brings clarity and direction to where we want to go. I usually say go with negation. If you are confused about the purpose of your life, now list out what is not the purpose of your life. Mm. The purpose of your life is not to be miserable and make others miserable. Yes. Not to be greedy and just get swayed away by someone else's mistakes. Yes. And you know, other thing I say is anger is a punishment. You give it to yourself or someone else mistake. <laughs> Man, is that the truth? You know, I got to tell you something. I never thought I would say that Gurudev and Matthew McConaughey share a similar belief system. But you know the actor Matthew McConaughey? He was just on my show recently. Uh -huh. And we were talking about trying to figure out who you are and what your identity is. And he goes, well, I think you ought to start with who you're not. What am I not? Okay. And it's almost <laughs> identical to what you just said. And so he said it with a totally different accent than you in a completely different background. But it's, this, it's a very similar conclusion. I actually really work on celebrating. And the reason is, is that I want to convince my neurochemistry, frankly, that this is worth doing again. How do you do it? I'd love life hacks because I, I, even with the book on the way here, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I haven't experienced the joy of having a book in an airport. And I used to fantasize about this mm -hmm. moment, and yet I haven't done it. Mm -hmm. So I went in the book, and I waited for somebody to walk by the section. It was a woman, yeah. and she st slowed enough. I said, hey, do you read these kinds of books? And she's like, I never would bother reading these books. I'm like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Has there ever She's like, well, I read Atomic Habits. I'm like, hey, you might want to buy it. I go to her and say, can I buy you my book? That's and so she beautiful. said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I and then she asked me where I'm from. She's from the same neighborhood. Oh, see. She, she's my neighbor. And I'm like, this must be That's the universe trying to reinforce the attempt. But how do you experience joy? Well, my experience of joy is very similar to what you just said. For some reason, for me, it's the reflection in other human beings, eyes, hearts, messages, et cetera. I allow myself to accept those compliments now. Whereas before, I'm like, yes, thank you, but you don't know I could have done better. And so I would rob myself from the, I could have done better thing. And now I accept that what I did was the best I could do in that moment. And I allow myself to feel uh, the embrace from other people. I gain, I've learned in my life, I gain significance. I feel significant when I contribute to the lives of other people. So I found my recipe. So I don't rob myself from that. The other thing I do is I allow myself to celebrate. Now, they're not long windows of celebration. I'm not any good at that yet. But when <laughs> something great happens, I'm good at having a cigar or a bottle of wine or a dinner with people or say, and wow, and reflecting for a moment. And I've, I've built that muscle of bliss. I talk about something called blissful dissatisfaction. People conflate bliss and hap happiness and satisfaction. They think, oh, if I allow myself to have a bunch of happiness or bliss, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my drive. I'm going to lose the recipe. So because I've kept myself in misery all my life, if I just stay in misery, I'll keep achieving. I found that to be true. I've actually found that as I finally started to celebrate. So I do that with reflection. I do that with uh, receiving the gratitude from other people. Um, also for me, we talked before we came on about my faith. For me, every time it happens, just my personal thing is to go, just thank you, Lord. Like, I, man, you're working in my life again. So it's an acknowledgement that it's not just me. And that I'm somehow glorifying a power greater than myself. For me, that's Jesus. For whatever anybody listening to that, that's fine. I'm not here to convert you today. But what I am saying to you is that it's a, it's a validation of my faith that there's something greater in life than just me or just this time here. 
And that, that's really that, the deep that is that part. That last part is the part that I've realized brings me a bliss. Mm -hmm. I'm always wondering why do I like to be surrounded by a pain or, you know, I mm -hmm. can't handle small talk. And yet when somebody brings up, you know, pain or suffering, it, you know, I get animated. Mm -hmm. And I realized I, I like to be reminded about my smallness and the irrelevancy of, of all things. It's very peaceful. It is. And, and I had the most incredible experiences over the last uh, year and a half meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. Whoa. Yeah, my, I, Whoa. I, these, these um, um, private visits with the Pope to talk about refugees and human rights. And then I went to a refugee center in Italy, Whoa. and it was meeting with what I would believe are my versions of LeBron James, like a dad who would go through, you know, f figuring out how to flee in a trunk of a car mm -hmm. to give his family a better life. And I always look at refugees and migrants and think we ask, you know, why are they coming here instead of what are they running from? And, yeah. But I realized, what is it about me that takes such peace and joy of being around that because it reminds me that oh this just doesn't matter the mm -hmm. the stuff the accolades you know the attention yeah what really matters is alleviating suffering like you saw in that little apartment yeah in queens and so like i went to, when i went before i went to see the pope i was like i'm such a bad catholic i, I really feel like i need to unburden myself i said can you send an emissary for me so that i can do confession and they're like oh, that's great and i was like but it needs to be really close like three steps from god you know like i have i need I, so someone the, high up i need someone really high up and i meet with the uh, i meet with the, it's in the book but i meet with the, the scalabrinis are the order that takes care of refugees and migraines and i was like that will do and they send the head the head of uh, the head, father leonir to meet me in little italy and we meet for three hours it was like the books opened up. I mean, hmm. because when somebody is that high up in the church, they actually have PhDs and mm -hmm. it's all this collected wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I was unburdening myself. Tears are flowing. Sure. And I was like, you know, I don't agree with this. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's okay, my child. You were given free will. You know, it was like everything mm -hmm. had the right Jedi answer. Mm -hmm. But then I was talking about the shame I was carrying. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't the book was just getting started. And I, and I was saying, I don't know how to deal with that. And I don't know. I don't know why I keep trying to he's like number one you're trying to go back and save your mother but the way to save your mother is to save those save others mm. you know what i mean and mm. but then also tells me the story of a, of a diamond ring it's like let me tell you a story of a diamond there was a diamond and it slipped off of one's finger and it went into the sewer and for years there's where it remained covered in slu sludge and mud until one day a little boy was playing in the street and his ball went down to that sewer and he saw it and him and his dad came out and they put a little you know hanger down they were able to bring it back up and it was dirty and whatever and they washed it off and there was a beautiful diamond. He's like, no matter how much sludge and mud we cover ourselves up, we were always a diamond. Yeah, and it was, good. so I had, is the point to that story is only, that's having so gone good. to the Vatican and spending time uh, around when I'm not particularly religious, I realized, oh, I, I, I need to be reminded of the irrelevancy of all these other things. I want to stay in that place of a 16-year-old boy mm -hmm. who witnessed suffering and powerlessness because that is more important than anything in my life, mm -hmm. any possession, and anything I'll ever do. So, but the achievement, having said all of that, yep. the achievement and the success gives you the platform to reach those right, people, right. and that's why it's important. And that's why sometimes you say, "Well, that means I don't have to achieve anything." Wrong. No, the authority. I say I'm collecting authority. The book is just my resume is an incoherent collection of authority to reach it. people at disparate places. Oh, you admire people on TV? Well, I'm on Shark Tank. You nailed. You it. admire wealth? I have a lot of things. Yep. You admire sports? I ran a few of those. Yep. But I, 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 I truly mean it. It is a degree calculated because mm -hmm. not, no one of these things particularly resonate. But collectively, they give me the authority to rewind the clock. You're 100%. You know and I mean? by the way, what you've discovered and I've discovered is what every human being who finds some leisure of bliss uh, discovers is that you were put here to help contribute to the lives of other people. That's really why you were put here in your own very unique and beautiful way. And sometimes for achievers, we're the last to figure that out. We Sometimes, are. often, it's people that work in a church or someone who's de dedicated their life, like my sister, to being a school teacher. She figured this out a lot sooner than I did. And although I've got a lot more money than her, she's had a lot more blissful moments and yeah. joyous moments in her life. And so sometimes us achievers, it takes us longer to figure it out. However, when we do, we have a platform and a stage and a reach that can make an impact that's even more money. I, I was with Warren Buffett once. Uh, at, he, he came to a Dolphins game, and uh, I got to spend a whole day with him walking mm -hmm. around. And I got to ask him about, you know, compounding interest and all a lot of his views. But one of them I had asked him about, um, how did he handle waiting until later in his life to make those big contributions to philanthropy? Yeah. And he told me, I took a lot of criticism for that. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I would struggle with it. But in my mind, I thought, going back to compounding, mm -hmm. that the ability for me to compound that money in my possession would mean that there would be a lot more of it to distribute mm -hmm. by the time I got to the end. Mm -hmm. I sort of thought that was fast because yeah. I'm sure you feel this about accomplishment, right? I'm a human being. I have aspirations and ambitions. I want to keep playing with my capacity and my potential. So I want to keep creating. 
And then I want to also ameliorate suffering. And yeah. sometimes they can feel attention. Mm -hmm. So it's like what I've tried to say is I'm allowed to be intentional about my boundaries. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to be a saint, mm -hmm. but at the, and I'm still accumulating power and resources yeah. yes. while redistributing concurrently. Mm -hmm. And then it's okay, right? I yep. still, because you know how sometimes I always say, I'm not here to go on a rescue mission. Yeah. I'm here to make a trajectory change in your life. Very good. You know, a deposit. Very but, good. But don't ask me to take custody over you. You know, well, that, that the word custody is really powerful. And I'm going to use it after mm -hmm. today because I think a lot of times people are waiting for somebody to take custody over their life. They're waiting for the government government to do it. Yep. They're waiting for one seminar they're going to go to or one book they read. And as good as my book is and as good as your book is, they still have to take custody of their lives. And and waiting for someone to come along and save you, you will be waiting until the day you die. That's true. And hopefully you've done well enough in your life that you are saved. Have a good day.